Looks like we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another recreational programming session with uh, Mr. Azuzin. Uh, let's make a little bit of an announcement and officially start the stream as usual. <clears throat> a red circle live on Twitch. And what are we doing today on Twitch.television website? Today we are doing game development and assembly. How about that? So I'm going to give the link to where we're doing all that at twitch.tv slash sodding. And I'm going to ping everyone who's interested in being pinged. There we go. The stream has officially started. The stream has officially started. That's an interesting topic, topic right? So um, so essentially, I was like just working on my you know background project, right, which is not for streaming. And uh, I was working with L format and um you know flat assembly and stuff like that and i found out that it is super easy to link flat assembly program with the static libraries it is actually way easier than i thought right so uh, i basically started to google up how to do that in general and uh this is the discussion that i found uh, by the way all the documentation of uh, flat assembly is done through uh, communication in this forum this is absolutely beautiful i really really love it uh, maybe one day I should create like an account on this uh, forum and maybe like, you know, uh, have a conversation there and stuff like that. But uh, that's basically it. Right. So essentially, this is for Linux uh, x86-64. And um, essentially, you create two sections, one text section, right? So dot text section is sort of like a conventional section where you store the code, right? And uh, the data section, this is the section where you store the data. You don't really have to do that, right? So maybe you can keep everything in a single section. But traditionally, people like to do like to separate this into separate sections. And uh, essentially, what you do, you declare some of the uh, symbols as externals, right? And it allows you to call to those symbols, right? So, for example, I can call here printf and I declare it as external and there you go, I can do that. But that's not enough. You, you won't be able to just compile this entire thing because Fosm doesn't know how to link thing. Uh, the only thing you will manage to produce is an object file that you'll have to link yourself with a linker. Right, but that, that's, you know, one of the steps that you, uh, that are acceptable usually in, in software development, right? So, and uh, so let's actually take a look at how, it, uh, you know, it would look like, right? So uh, let me do a probe, uh, maybe maybe somewhere in Sodi. And uh, so Fasm libc, right? So this is going to be Fasm libc. I'm going to create something like, uh, you know, main asm. And uh, the the mode that I use in here is nasm. Maybe I should actually reconfigure my Emacs so it automatically uses the Fasm mode. So the first thing we have to do, we have to say that the format is going to be elf uh, 64, right? So then I'm going to create a section for the code, right? So this is going to be the text section is going to be executable. And I'm going to create the second section uh, where I'm going to have the data, right? So this is going to be just that, executable. So I don't really know what I'm going to put in the data, right? But one of the things I'm going to put in the text is I'm going to put the entry point, right? So as far as I know, you have to sort of like declare the symbol uh, start as public. And what we're going to do in here, I suppose we can just call to printf, right? So that would be nice, actually. So, and we're going to say that printf is going to be an external symbol, right? So there you go. And we're probably going to use the, so I suppose we just follow the usual, you know, new call convention on x86-64 Linux. Uh, so for that, we're going to just put a message in here, right? So we're going to move a message to RDA, RDI, if I remember correctly, right? So in the message, going to be uh, something like this in here. So it's going to be hello world, uh, right, probably with a, a new line and probably also new terminated because that's what usually what you usually work with in C, right. And uh, that's basically it. So another interesting thing they're doing here, instead of like calling to exit syscall directly, they're using underscore exit function from the standard library of C, right, because they are linking with libc. Uh, right, so maybe this is something that we can do as well. It sounds like a pretty cool idea. Uh, right, so I'm going to move this entire thing in here. And I'm going to move to RDI. Um, so let's actually put zero in here and call to exit. So that should be enough. Uh, that should be enough. If I try to do fasm main.asm, uh, it actually created an O file. It actually created an O file. So, and uh, the next thing you have to do, you have to actually link 
uh, this entire thing. So you have to do LD, uh, like main.o, right? So we can try to do that. Uh, and as you can see, if you just try to link this entire thing, it will say that it doesn't know anything about symbols, printf, and underscore exit. And this is because you, you want to link with the C library. Right, so there's a couple of warnings. Uh, has a load segment with uh, RWX, um, you know, read write execution permission, which is kind of interesting. So, yeah, this is because they have data, so which is probably has to be readable. So, let's actually do uh, that thing one more time. So, it's going to be main.o. I'm going to link with LC. Uh, and um, so, section data is cannot be readable. So, I suppose it has to be writable then. Is that what you want? Okay, so it, it wants to be writable, apparently not just readable, but writable. Uh, and afterwards we got a file, right? So afterwards we got a file and it doesn't really execute. It doesn't really execute. So they're using a very specific dynamic linker in there, right? So maybe that's one of the things we have to do as well. Uh, right, so let's actually give it a try. Maybe that's what it wants. Uh, right, so that created another thing. Uh, right, so it's we still cannot do that. So uh, usually what I can do with executables, I can do LDD and there you go here, I can see a dynamic linker. Uh, right, so the dynamic linker that they actually suggested to you is just a sim link to this one, I suppose. Maybe we, we have to use that linker directly instead. Right, so let's actually try to use that linker directly instead. Uh, let's remove that thing in here. Uh, right, and if I could take a look at LDD, it actually points to that linker directly. And if I run this entire thing, it says, hello world. Right. So I'm not calling to syscalls of Linux directly. I'm actually linking with libc, with the system libc, and I'm calling libc. Right. So as you can see, it is in fact relatively straightforward, right? So uh, I have to a, a little bit of the additional syntax, right? Instead of segments, I have to use sections. And also I have to use an external program for linking. But apart from that, I can actually do that, right? So, but the question is, what other interesting libraries I can actually link with? What other interesting library I can actually link with? And obviously, I must try Raylib. So let's give it a try. So I already have a Raylib somewhere in here. So uh, b before we can do that, I, I think it would probably make sense to create a make file, right? So it makes sense to create a make file. So let me actually take uh, the, our build thing, right? So first thing we want to do, first thing we want to do, we want to create like an O file, right? An O file is going to depend on main.asm. And to create an O file, we have to do fasm command, right? So this is going to be something like this. After that, we want to create, I suppose, main file, which is going to depend on main.o. And the thing it is going to do, it is going to basically use the linker to create all of that stuff. So on top of that, maybe we want to do something like this, uh, right? So now I should be able to just do make and and it seems to be working, right? So it resolves the dependencies and stuff like that. So we have an extra a.out and everything. So I'm going to go to Mutualizer, right? So and in the Mutualizer, I do have already pre-built static array leap, which I can actually copy paste in here, right? So and let's just go ahead and try to link straight up link with array leap in here. Okay, will I be able to do that, right? So let's just give it a try. So there is no such thing, uh, raylib, no such file or directory. Okay, so what if, what if I just use like search path uh, as dot? All right, all right, all right. So it just linked with the raylib. It doesn't use raylib, but it just linked with it. That is interesting, isn't it? I, th I think that's pretty interesting. Okay, okay, okay. So what if I define one of the external symbols of raylib? So what if I do something like init window. So will that work? Okay, it it complains that it doesn't know SQRTF. So that means it wants to link with more libraries, right? Because Raylib depends on a math library and stuff like that. So we can do that. We can actually just try to provide that, uh, right? So it's going to be LM uh, and see what's going to happen. Okay, so there's a couple of warnings, like node GNU stack section implies executable stack. 
Uh, that's actually really funny. So I suppose the linker has this sort of convention that if you have uh, this section, it doesn't make the stack executable, otherwise it makes it. And that's, that's very interesting. This is something interesting to discuss. Uh, but in any case, uh, yeah, it, it seems to be compiling, right? So it, it, it calls to hello world, but it doesn't call to anything from Raylib or anything like that. So maybe we should tr just try to call to init window right so um so what's the what's the stuff in in Raylib? Well, we, we actually need to find uh the definition of Raylib. so we need a header right because i don't really remember the signatures of this stuff and and everything so uh let me actually see so i'm gonna go to raylib.h um, and init window uh, right, so we have three arguments in here, width and height and the title, so we can provide them. Uh, RDI is going to be 800, so RSI uh, is going to be 600. And I think the third argument is RDX, right, and we can have a title somewhere in here. Uh, so we can have a title which says something like, hello, Raylib from Fasm, right, so I'm going to put a zero in here, and we can just call to init uh, window right so we can just go to init window and interestingly we can try the following thing what if we well i mean yeah we we'll probably need to call to should close window and stuff like that right uh so by the way i should have not actually removed exit i think this particular exit is going to be useful right so uh we initialize the window so what's going to be the next thing the next thing has to be should uh, window should close, right? So we should call to this specific function. Extern window should close. All right, so call uh, window should close. And as far as I know, the result in x86-64 Linux calling convention is returned through racks. And uh, since it returns Boolean, right, so false is going to be zero. So we can actually test uh, racks against itself, right? So which essentially uh, which essentially going to check whether it's zero or not, right? So, and essentially, if it is uh, zero, so JZ, um, we can say, I don't know, over, right? So we can jump to something like over, uh, right? And over is going to be somewhere here. And I suppose it's going to just call to close window, right? So this is going to be close window, uh, right? So, so this is going to be close window. Uh, okay, so yeah, we just check this thing in here and we probably want to organize a loop, right? So maybe we're going to have unconditional jump to again, which checks this entire thing again, right? So we check in whether we should close the window over and over and over again, uh, right? So, and in here we have to call to begin drawing, right? So then we have to call to end drawing. We have to call to end drawing and I suppose between those things well i mean we can just keep it as it is right so we can just keep it as it is and uh right so this is going to be begin drawing and end drawing and let's see if such a simple program like this is the simplest boilerplate that you can have in relief is going to compile uh right so let's do make it, it just compiled and it just, yeah. So I suppose we should use GNZ. So yeah, that's going to be the topic of today's stream. So <laughs> apparently uh, in FASM, it is super easy to link with external libraries and reuse some of the existing code. And really, it's such a simple library that you can call to it through assembly. So that sounds like a cool idea for a stream, doesn't it? That sounds like a freaking cool idea. So and that's why I'm streaming today. So yeah, welcome to Zosin session. How about that? Uh, all right, so we should maybe write some sort of a game. We should write some sort of a game. What kind of game should we write? I'm not even sure. Maybe something simple, right? So I don't really want to, uh, you know, milk this idea for too long. I generally don't like to milk a single idea for too long because it, it doesn't work. Right? <laughs> because of the format of, of my streams, it doesn't really work that well. So uh, anyways, so the first thing we probably have to do, we probably have to clean the 
the background, right? So we're not uh, setting the background color like at all. So the usual way we do that is through the function clear background, right? So which accepts a structure. What a bummer, isn't it? What a bummer. But color structure is rather an interesting structure, isn't it? So it's actually a structure that consists of four bytes. So it's literally fits into 32 bit integer and that is actually done intentionally so you can use sort of like the the hex color codes uh as the values and stuff like that and i wonder and i wonder if i can do something like rda rdi not rda rdi uh and say something like ff 0 ff so i'm essentially like passing an entire structure as an integer uh, right, so I'm passing the entire structure as an integer and I'm calling to clear uh, background, right? So something like that. And I suppose if I try to compile it right now, if I try to compile it right now, it's, it will say that the clear background you know, does not exist. Uh, so we have to actually uh, export it, right? So clear background. I wonder if it's going to work. I wonder if such a small structures are actually passed as integers and stuff like that. They, they are! Uh, they're passed as integers, apparently. So, yeah. <laughs> That's how freaking easy it is. I love it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, this is how an entire color structure is passed under the hood. Right, so that's how an entire color structure is passed under the hood. It's actually pretty cool. So, but I don't really like such a harsh color. I would like to put something like 80, 80, 80. Right, so I think that's much better. And there we go. So that's a much better structure. Look at the speed of the compilation. Look at the speed of this entire thing. So look how quickly this entire thing compiles. Right, so just like... <laughs> um, I'm actually really curious about this like a uh, node GNU stack section. I wonder if I can just create that section somehow, just like create an empty section, uh, section GNU, without any writes or anything like that. So, okay. So I just created a section with this name and the linker does not complain anymore. And I wonder if I can just run this game. It, it runs it. Okay, so that's fine. <laughs> so the presence of this uh, section indicates to the linker that you don't want to have an executable stack, which actually makes sense. You don't really want your stack to be executable, don't you? Do you? I mean, I don't know how to do tag questions in English. Okay, this is my second language. Uh, right. So that's kind of interesting. So, and I wonder why it opts in to executable stack without that specific section maybe because if like objects don't have that specific sections these are like very old sections which are written in a very very weird c that may require executable stack for whatever freaking reason so i don't really know that's very interesting so but we we can keep this section in here just to like remove the warning because why not uh, and it doesn't really require anything in that section. Like, it doesn't even need any permissions, like, executable, writable. And it, like, it doesn't even have any content, right? It's just, like, it's just there. Um, yeah, yeah, so th that's a good point. I think LD just expects C runtime. And C runtime on Linux, GNU slash Linux, as I, or as I call it, GNU plus Linux, probably ha usually has this section, right? So we, by using Fasm, we are sort of on this um, uncharted territory, right? So we're not really C. Anyways, it is what it is, and it isn't what it isn't. Is it not, minor friend? I think it is. The next thing we have to do, minor friend, we have to draw something on the screen. Draw something on the screen. So what kind of shice can we draw? Uh, so we probably can draw rectangle, right? So we can draw rectangle. Holy shit. I only now realized a pure genius of Ray San. Ray Sama. Pure genius of Ray Sama. I always wondered, like, why sort of the basic signatures, the basic signatures of these shape functions are usually integers. 
because like obviously the library can work with floats and stuff like that and it actually demonstrates that it's capable of working with floats uh, in different versions of the same functions for example there is a draw rectangle v which accepts vector 2 and vector 2 is a floating point vector so as far as i know it's defined in array math right and if i take a look at the definition of this entire thing as you can see it is in fact floating point like why for this sort of like the basic functions the functions that you're gonna use uh for the first time they use integers well it kind of makes it easy to use this function from assembly actually because in in assembly at least in x86 64 linux convention calling convention you pass integers through rdi rsi rags your mom you know the integer registers and the the floating points as far as i know if i remember correctly they're passed through this weird cmd registers and stuff like that it's just like it makes it super convenient for uh to to run from assembly right maybe that's the reason Maybe. Yes, your mom register. It's the widest register in the x86 69 processor. Your mom register. <laughs> the widest one so far. CMD is nuts. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> anyway. <sighs> so, yeah. Let's give it a try. We, we should actually give it a try. Uh, and see how it goes. And again, color actually makes it super easy to uh, to pass it through through the registers and stuff like that. So yeah. Uh, so now I'm gonna go into the main. So we'll still have to learn how to work with floats at some point anyway. And the problem is that I, I keep forgetting how to do how to use floats in assembly <laughs> in x86 64 assembly specifically. Um, right, so let me see, let me see, so here is the clear background, nothing particularly special, uh, move RDI, uh, so this is going to be 0, RSI is going to be 0, then RDX, uh, RDX is the stuff, so let me define the calling convention, so the calling convention of the regular functions is the same as the syscall, so I'm going to use this Chromium OS uh you know table right because it actually contains sort of like the calling convention um let me let me just find that there we go so rdi rsi rdx r10 i, I hope i hope it's r10 actually so r10 it yeah let's actually make it smaller maybe like 100 by 100 and uh the next one is going to be uh, R8, which is rather in weird choice, but okay. And in here, we're gonna actually use the red color, right? So this is gonna be just a red color, and we're gonna do draw rectangle, and hopefully that is going to be uh, the the thick. Okay, so that's kind of weird. That is kind of weird, so it doesn't really work. RDI, RSI, RDX, R10, and then 8. So we did a little bit of a fucky wacky and potentially oopsie doopsie. So it's probably not how it works, which begs the question. So how the fuck do you even do that? Uh, right. So we can actually cheat a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna cheat a little bit for CD. We're gonna create a, a C program. <laughs> We're gonna just like look it up. We're gonna just look up uh, how exactly you call to, to to this function, right? So we're gonna disassemble it and, and everything and you know. Okay, so don't tell my mom, by the way. Don't tell my mom that I cheated a little bit. Um, okay, so I'm gonna probably copy paste the Ray Lib. Uh, we probably need all of these things, right? Ray Math and RLGL. Uh, I'm going to just mark them and I'm going to copy paste them in here because I think it's particularly useful. Uh, and in here, so maybe this one is going to be called test, right? So it's going to be called test and the test is going to be like one of these things in here. So we're going to actually do CC uh, test test C and we're going to just link with array lib. Uh, just link with array lib. Okay. And to be fair, we can actually create something like all, which is going to sort of build both of these things in here. We're going to build both of them simultaneously. All right, that seems to be working. That seems to be at working. So and one of the things I want to do is probably to just call, uh, well, I mean, I want to include 
uh, a ray deep. Right? So I'm going to call it ray deep, and I'm going to do draw rectangle, and we're just calling to that zero zero. Uh, 100 to 100 and this is going to be just a red all right so and let's just try to compile this entire thing of course this entire thing wants to link with a math everyone wants to link with math and there we go i wonder and i wonder if i can simply obj dump this thing obj dump minus d holy shit that's a lot of damage okay so uh, <clears throat> that's a lot of code i wonder if i can not do that can i just simply create something like this something like this yeah that's a way better idea in my opinion honestly that's a way better idea because now i have that and that's a very small file as you can see 1.3 kilobyte so it's basically the code but it's not linked with anything it is not linked with anything so then i can do obj dump on this big and see how exactly it calls to uh, draw all right so we, we can't see how it calls to anything in here so here is the main uh call to main where is it though? Where is it though? It did it actually like factor? There is only one call to. Okay. Uh, all right, all right. Aha. Uh -huh. This mother flipper, I swear to God. <laughs> Why the fuck it, it actually calls them in a different order, right? So RSI, RDI, then RDX, RCX. Right, and only then this kind of thing, which is R8. Uh, right, and I suppose, where is the red? Uh, so there's this kind of thing. Right, yeah. So, and as you can see, this is, yeah, so uh, essentially, it's sort of like a placeholder. Right. So since this entire object file is not linked with anything, I think it just puts like an index of a symbol there or something like that so it's going to be the job of the linker to come in in here later and replace that with an appropriate address so that's why it's just like it calls to something but it doesn't really know where it calls to right it calls somewhere it's not the job of the compiler to know where exactly it's going to be calling uh right so yeah so i can use m um, intel flag it doesn't really matter so i can kind of read a simple at and t assembly so it's not that big of a deal uh, right, so let's actually try to do that. Sure. Uh, so M Intel Intel. There we go. Look at that. Finally, proper assembly. Uh, proper assembly. So EX. Uh, so what are they fucking doing in here? Are they computing the? I feel like they're computing something in here, right? So they're definitely computing. Uh, so RSI RDI rdx rcx and only then r8 and i suppose eax is computing of the color right it, it is probably computing of the color and it's such a weird way of computing the color honestly like why is it not like a you know a single thing that you just put in there why does it have to be constructed out of these weird things do you guys think like, why does it have to be constructed like that? Because if we take a look at the ray lib, and if we take a look at the definition of red, right, it is this, right, but you could have optimized that out, right? You could have optimized it into a single thing. And maybe that's what you do if you enable all of the optimizations, right? So what if we just do O3 in here, right, O3, and just, like, do it like that, right? So what is it, what is it going to happen? That's a very interesting question. Let's find out. And... Uh, where is the shaisu? And that's exactly what happened, right? So it basically optimized it out. That's kind of interesting. So without explicitly enabling optimizations, it was actually like computing the value of this structure at runtime, doing like ors and ends and stuff like that. So yeah, it was not collapsing that into a single like a thing that it would pass in there, which is kind of weird but i mean okay uh yeah and on top of that for for the things that where we pass the 
zeros is just like, replace them with zor right so maybe it would make sense to actually do optimization and stuff like that holy fuck this is so interesting isn't it this is so interesting this is so fascinating so anyway uh we already can see the calling convention rsi rdi rcx rdx so the syscall convention does not you know that does not correspond to the call convention one to one i was fucking lied to i was fucking lied to what the fuck uh what is r8d anyway i think it's like it's a chunk of r8 right x86 64 uh registers Right, you know how there is Rex and there is EAX, which is half of Rex, and there's also X, which is half of EAX and stuff like that. Right, so I think it's one of those. I think it is. Yeah, boy, look at that. So, okay, R8 is 64, R8D is 32 bit. It's like a lower half of it. And there's also R8W, which is 16-bit, and there's no 8-bit versions of R8. So it's kind of similar to this older registers, Rex, EX, EX, blah, blah. Oh. Short for D word, yeah, exactly. Uh, short for D word. Um, so is there like can we even find x86 64 call convention like linux uh call abi okay so we can we can actually maybe find something in there so call convention x86 69 call convention i mean we already kind of figured it out but i mean so on 32 bits it uses stack which is disgusting disgusting uh and on 64 it uses bruv just give me like the <laughs> uh, whatever uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and just you know go to where is my main dot asm uh, and we can clearly see so rsi uh, rsi rdi right rsi rdi Mm, rcx uh, rcx rdx rdx and then uh, r8 and that is basically it so if i try to build this entire thing and then just run uh this entire stuff as you can see we have a triangle so we have a triangle but i'm not actually sure so what's the first argument so if i like increase the width by by two is it going to be width or is it going to be height it is actually height so rcx is actually this one so it has to be like this and if i increase uh this by like 100 right is it gonna go to right or is it gonna go down uh that's the main question it actually went down it actually went down so that means this is the final convention right this is the first argument rdi is the first rsi is the second rdx is the third rcx is the fourth and r8 is uh, the fifth right so that's the call convention right for for regular functions not for the uh not for the syscalls syscalls use actually slightly different convention we figured it out just like hackers without any documentation right so we just hacked into the binaries we looked at the examples and there we go we figured that shice out figured that shice out isn't that bogus i think that's pretty freaking bogus so the next thing is to actually have some sort of a state for this goddamn triangle uh some sort of a state and we, we can keep the state somewhere in here right so here we have a title uh so we may have something like a x and y right so this is going to be x uh so i suppose db is basically byte uh w is going to be word uh double word is going to be 32 bit right and if i have uh, want to have 64 bits it's going to be dq uh so i suppose i want to actually have 32 bits right so this is going to be 32 bits and i'm going to initialize that with zero so and then I, I can have something like y uh right so essentially i have two 32 bits words uh so that's pretty cool so that means now i can probably move 
the content of x into here, but I want to move it as, um, you know, double word, right? So I want to move it as double word, and that is not going to compile, if I understand FASM correctly. That is not going to compile. Yeah, there we go. So operand size do not match. So that means I have to actually move them into 32-bit versions of these registers. Only then I can do that. And if I'm explicitly saying uh, the 32-bit versions of the registers, I don't really have to specify the size of the read in here. I can just read it. So it will automatically infer the size of the read from the size of the register, if I understand this shise correctly. Right, if I do understand that shise correctly. That is very bogus. And then I, I can just now uh, start modifying these things. I can just prepend that with uh, something like that. And there we go. So as you can see, we modify these variables in the memory and they do modify the position of the rectangle. So the next thing is going to be to modify them in runtime right is going to be to modify them in runtime and one of the things we can do we can just straight up do something like uh the word x is that something you can do in x8669 i actually i'm actually not sure but maybe you are able to do something like that so let me see yo what the fuck yo what the fuck it actually works <laughs> Apparently, you can increment memory directly. Uh, so, so that's what you can do in x86-69, right? You can modify memory directly. You also have the widest register, your mom. Uh, so, yes, yes, yes. That's pretty poggers. Um, <clears throat> What's going to be the next thing? We probably maybe want to, uh, you know, move out. But but here's the thing. What I usually do, what I usually do, I have uh, some sort of like a dx and dy, right? dx and dy that are essentially like floating points. And why is it highlighted like that? Like dx? Yeah, that's, that's kind of weird. But, but anyway. So, and essentially, I multiply them by the time by the delta time of the frame and delta time of the frame is the floating point right it is in fact a floating point so that means if i want to do like um, precise computations and stuff like that i still need to uh work with floating points but i have no idea how to work with them so that means yeah 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 chat already chat already reminds me xmm yeah we will have to go into xmm and i'm not really uh, you know familiar with xmms and stuff like that but we can actually do the same trick that we did with uh you know with the draw rectangle right so we can do the same trick and for instance we can just do something like this i can get frame time right so I can get frame time and I can call to uh, something like this, right? And then I can just recompile this entire stuff. Okay, so we have some weird stuff in assembly. Uh, let's just remove it for now and let's just explore, right? So let's just explore. So there's a test and we can do obg dump uh, m intel d. And what do we have in here? Holy shit. <laughs> Okay, so where is the call? So there is a first call, which is uh, rather interesting, right? So it's a call uh, to get frame time, right? And where is the result? Where is the result? So the result is, I suppose, in, in EX, right? So the result is probably there. Then we just load this stuff in here. Uh, so there's a lot of obscure stuff because of the optimizations and stuff like that so what i would like to do actually is to disable this thing so we only have get frame time and then uh i can disable all of the optimization optimization god bolt to help bruh what the fuck do you think this is what the fuck do you think god bolt is This is good bull. Like, why do I have to use some sort of like a third party thing and, and everything? It's just like, you can have it at home, right? It's just, it works the same way. I'm, 
I wonder if uh, actually God Bolt uses OBG dump under the hood or something like that. And I'm just like that's that's a good question actually. That's kind of interesting. Does it use OBG dump or maybe it uses something something else? Uh, where is the association with the C code? You don't need association with C code. We're assembly programmers. You don't need stinky C. Right. Uh, we are both that. We are both that C. All right. Anyways, so let me now uh, take a look at that stuff. And what do we have? So we don't have. Okay. Uh, wait a second. Um, uh huh. So the result, floating point result, is returned through XMM zero in x86 69 Linux calling convention. That is very poggers, I think. That is actually very cool. Uh, so that's actually super cool. And for instance, let's imagine, let's imagine if I have some sort of a position right so let's actually call this delta time and then i'm going to call this some sort of a position which is going to be just like 420 right so this is going to be 420 and the next thing i want to do i want to multiply uh you know some sort of a position by uh get frame time right so what is going to happen what is going to happen um so i might as well what would be the easiest way to actually do all of that stuff so I can just recompile this thing, right? And then, um, yeah, I don't know. I need to come up with a better uh, sort of like approach to things. Okay, so essentially, we are moving some shit from the memory, from the memory into the XMM register. Okay, so, and then we are moving XMM register to a different place in the memory. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. Then we call, so, so th this is with all of the optimizations disabled. So that's probably why it shuffles the same shit like over like around and, and stuff like that. So that's probably why. So then it calls to get frame. It returns, it gets the result from the get frame time through XMM0 and then moves it into EAX. So then it can save that stuff somewhere on the stack, right? It saves that stuff somewhere on the stack. Then it moves something from the stack into XMM, then multiplies something from the stack by the XMM. Okay, I, I think I understand how this entire stuff works. And then saves the XMM back onto the stack. Right. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So essentially, if I want to do multiplications on the XMM registers and stuff like that, I have to use these sort of like uh, SS operations and stuff like that. By the way, here is the interesting question. Can I say instead of m move ss and like mul ss like move like this and then mul like this? I think I should be able to know if I don't think so. <laughs> uh, so <yeah. clears throat> but that would be cool, wouldn't it? I think that would be cool actually because as far as i know I, I i don't know how this letter is called actually i don't know how this letter is called but as far as i know it's a, it's a shortcut for this right it is a shortcut for this uh now let me let me see let me see yeah i think i'm basically ready actually i really like that so isn't an xmm like a 128 or something like, like what's the size of xmm uh so it's a cmd register uh, x86 uh, CMD like XMM registers. I think they are like wide wide registers. One twenty eight. Yeah, exactly. But if you're doing like D word read, it's gonna it's not gonna read like entirely into this thing, right? So it's only only gonna read into the lower like bits of the of the register. So that's probably that's probably the thing. Uh, right. Uh, so yeah. Let me now go into main.asm. So this is going to be... Mm, we also want to be able to truncate from the float to an integer, right? Because I still kind of want to use um, draw rectangle, 
even though I'm using floating points and stuff like that, I still kind of use draw rectangle. But maybe I should not actually limit myself to draw rectangle and start using uh, draw rectangle V, right? So draw rectangle V. But the problem with the draw rectangle V, look how many stuff it actually accepts. Look how much stuff it accepts, right? So it accepts position, which is actually two floats, and a size, which is another two floats. Well, I mean, it's not that much compared to this version, which accepts four integers. So this one accepts four floats, but as two arguments because they are structures. And I wonder what's going to happen in terms of call convention, right? If I just pass two structures in there, is, is it going to be like a four separate, uh, four separate arguments in there? Uh, so I think that's very interesting. I would like to take a look at that as well. Uh, man, this is actually extremely educational, honestly. Like, I find learning about this kind of stuff, like, through experimenting, way more efficient for myself than reading, like, documentation and stuff like that. Because at least I can maintain my attention span while doing this entire thing. Right. You know, like, when you're reading the, this very, like, fake terse documentation, it's really difficult to, like, keep focused on that. But if you are just fucking around, if you're just experimenting, you constantly sort of engage, right? So you constantly engage and you never really get tired of that and stuff like that. So this is so fucking fun, isn't it? I think it's freaking fun. I absolutely love that. Anyway, so uh, here's the position, here's the size, and here's the color. So for the position, we can do vector. So this is going to be, let's say the position is going to be 1, 2. Right, so this is the position 1, 2, and size again is going to be 3, 4. So the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to distinguish them, right? So I want to somehow distinguish them. And the color is going to be the color red, right? So let's actually pass the color red. So the only thing I want to do is I want to see how exactly these kind of things are going to be passed in there. And I suppose one of the things we want to do is, is we want to enable all of the optimizations. Um, you know, I have an idea, actually. So I'm going to do test. Uh, which depends on test O, and I'm going to do this obg thingy right in the make file. I think I'm going to do the obg thingy right in the uh, in the make file on test O. There we go. So, and then I'm going to do make test, and it will automatically do all of that stuff for me, which is actually very cool. Which is actually very cool. Okay, so it moves this huge as thing into racks. Okay, so that allocates some stuff on the stack. When you subtract some some value from RSP, it, that means it allocates the stack, right? So do, do, do you guys know how the, the stack works in x86, 64? Uh, right, so the stack work uh, like grows towards like a zero addresses and stuff like that. Right. So let me show you. Here is your memory. Here is your memory. So this is your memory. Imagine that. So this is the zero, and this is the beginning of the stack, right? And this is where RSP actually points to. When you allocate something on the stack, you do not increment RSP. No, 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 no. You decrement RSP by the size of the variable which you want to allocate. And RSP now points at here. So, and the reason why, I think, is because then you can just use RSP as the address to read and write into the value that you just allocated, because you read and write from left to right. So now you just point at the beginning of the value that you just allocated, and you can just work with that. Uh, right, so that's how it works. And every time you see in assembly that somebody is subtracting something from RSP, they just allocated 64-bit um, value on the stack. That's what they did. Right. So, okay, so they moved this huge S value into racks. Okay, they allocated something on the stack. They moved this thing into uh, EDI, which is probably the color. This looks like a color. Then they move this huge S value into XM11. I have no idea why they do it like that, but anyway. So then they move this huge S value into XMM0, and then they call this entire thing. All right, that is very interesting. So I suppose the first vector, the entirety of the first vector is passed through XMM0, 
and the entirety of the second vector is passed through XMM one. So yeah, that's that's actually very interesting. So how huge is this entire thing is? Right, so how huge is this entire thing is? So let me let me see. So uh, one, two, three, four. So this is the first 32 bit. One, two, three, four. Okay, it pass, passed the entire vector two structure through a single XMM register. Right. That is actually very cool. Right. So <laughs> is that the is that the convention? Is that the convention? So essentially, when you call this function, this entire structure is passed in its entirety through a single XMM register. Through a single XMM register. That's pretty cool, I think. Mm. So now we know. And I suppose since, according to this entire convention, um, you return floats through XMM0, maybe if when you return vector 2, you also return the entirety of the vector through that register. Um, this is actually super cool. This is actually super cool. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> Main is just the next instruction after the call. Right, so again, I already explained why this call looks so weird. Right, this is a call to draw, you know, rectangle V. But it calls to sort of like the next instruction. So where it calls at this specific stage doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter because we compiled, we compiled this entire thing with minus C, which compiled only the object file that needs an additional linking step. So after this compilation, the program doesn't even know where all of these functions are located. It will be figured out at the linking stage by the linker. That's why this call looks so weird and points to some like random bush I see. right? So yeah, so don't pay too much attention to the addresses where it's calling because they are not figured out yet. And I did that intentionally because if I link this entire thing, if I link this entire thing, it's going to be too much garbage because it will link like all the code and stuff like that. Maybe in the OBG dump, there is a way to only dump a specific function. I do, don't really know that. Right, so we, we can Google it up. Uh, OBG dump, uh, dump specific, uh, maybe disassemble. Uh, okay, so disassemble specific function. They, yeah, they know exactly what they need. They know exactly what they need. They assemble one single function using OBG dump. Okay, so maybe we can use that. And in that case, call is going to look a little bit better. So if you a very recent bin, it is very simple. Passing disassemble symbol to OBG dump will disassemble only this specific function. No need to pass the start address and the end address and stuff like that. Okay, so that is very interesting. This is something that we can try. Sure. Uh, all right, instead. Mm -hmm. So disassemble. Uh, maybe uh, I can disassemble main, right? So I want to look into the main. So, and because of that, we can just do O. So this is going to be the test, which is going to just create the test. Uh, and afterwards, I suppose we can just actually maybe merge all of these things together, right, into a single test. So it's going to create an executable test, and then it's going to disassemble that specific function. Uh, and uh, undefined reference, of course, if we want to build this entire thing, we have to link it with the ray leap, uh, lm, and what else do we have in here? So, uh, yeah, we have to actually search for this entire thing in here. Uh, okay. Well, that didn't help, right, as you can see. Uh, and this is because we are uh, actually looking at the wrong thing. Uh, test is up to date. Yeah, let's do it like that. And it still shows too much garbage. I wonder if this is because we provide minus D in here. So if I just do it like that, uh, look at that. Now it looks nice. Does, does it look better now? Right, now it knows the function. It, it actually looks better, right? So at least it actually prints the, the name of the function that it is calling. Uh, right, so 
I guess that is better. Okay, okay, you won, you won. That that is better. That is better. So now we're gonna be using that from now on, uh, because it's very convenient to, to just see where exactly that function is located and stuff like that. Uh, so that is all fun, uh, but I ran out of tea. Shut, shut, shut. I ran out of tea, unfortunately. So we need to make a small break. And after a small break, we're going to continue slapping the code. We're going to continue hacking the code. And eventually, we're going to hack the entire game. So, yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, let's go ahead and continue. Let's go ahead and continue. So, what we figured out, we figured out how this kind of stuff is actually, uh, you know, used. We do understand that. And I would like to maybe try to just run um, draw vector V draw vector v i think that's going to be very interesting so i want to rename this entire main stuff to game stuff right because i look at uh you know the files and I see main i don't don't really know where is my game and where is my test stuff right so test stuff is in here and uh, the game is called main but it, it would be better to actually call it uh, game instead of main uh right so i can clearly replace main with game uh, so here is the game stuff, uh, and this is the, the main stuff. Okay, that's pretty cool. So uh, furthermore, since I'm actually separate, uh, compiling this thing separately, I don't really need all anymore. Now I can do make game. I can just make the game, and uh, then I can make test, which also uh, prints this entire thing. Uh, so that's pretty cool, actually. I really like that. Uh, okay, so the, the problem with the game... Uh, the problem with the game is that it doesn't know draw rectangle V, right? So it doesn't understand that specific symbol. Um, so let me let me see what we can do. Uh, right, so we can do extern. And by the way, it's not external, extern. Uh, fuzzy mode. Extern. <clears throat> and instead of doing this kind of stuff, instead of doing this kind of stuff how can we even approach this thing um, so let me see so we can say that the position is going to be zero zero and the size is going to be uh, 100 by 100 right so that's going to be just that and if i do test if i do test what does it look like so it does just pick soar on xmm zero which i suppose just zeros it out Right, it simply zeroes it out. Uh, nothing particularly special. So, which is something that we can try to do as well. Uh, right. So, this is going to be just that. And let me try to compile the game. And it does, in fact, compile. So, it, it recognizes that as a correct uh, valid instruction, which I'm super happy about. All right. So, what else do we have in here? So, and here... It literally like hard codes. I mean, that, that's probably fine. All right, look at that. That's probably fine. I wonder if there is a way for me to explicitly, right, to not work with floats in such a cryptic way, if you know what I mean. Right? <laughs> it is a very cryptic way. Though, what's funny is that in this specific uh, hexadecimal literal, it is very obvious that you have two numbers in here. So here is the first number and here is the second one. So, but I still don't want to work with floats in such way. It's fucking dumb. Honestly, it is fucking dumb. <laughs> I wonder if one of the things I can do in here is just basically, okay, I have uh, racks and I can move something like this. Can I just move floating point like that in here? Um, which also raises the question. So that is basically the... Uh, lower bits of the number but now i want to shift this entire thing right i want to shift the entire thing how do i do that do i do that shift left racks by 32 bits and then move this thing again because how do you get the upper 32 bits of racks so as far as i know you can only take ex which is lower 32 bits of racks but what is the upper uh, 32 bits. I think there is, it, it is not a thing in there. Uh, we, we did in fact have, uh, yeah. So there's no such thing as upper 32 bits. Um, so 
Because of that, we kind of have to do this kind of thing. Or maybe... So this is something that should be actually computable at compile time of the assembler, right? So the assembler should provide the facility for me to just like pack, um, you know, several floats into this like thing, but I don't freaking know. I don't freaking know, mind of throwing the, I don't freaking know. Uh, so, and after that, we're just moving, uh, we're just moving uh, this stuff into XMM, right? So it's gonna be like this. Is this really, uh, Intel assembly because what the fuck is move Q? <laughs> I don't think it's, I don't think it's Intel assembly. Maybe it is. Uh, I don't freaking know. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it. So here we filled with zeros the first thing. We filled with zeros the first thing, and then we actually put two hundred and two hundred into the second thing, and then I suppose we need to put the core into RDI, right? So RDI is going to be. Uh, red color in our case. So this is the red color. And there we go. So this is the first argument. This is the position. I mean, yeah. Position. Position, I said. Uh, size and the color. And after that, we simply call to draw rectangle V. Uh, draw rectangle V. Uh, draw rectangle V. Okay, so we also do this kind of thing, but it's kind of useless, right? Because we don't really do anything with that anymore, right? So, uh, okay, so let me try to build a game. Uh, so it doesn't like move. Okay, so is that because it won't skew? Okay, it it won't skew. Uh, what's a, what's what's move skew? <laughs> Isn't it move quarter or move quad word? Yeah, yeah, move quad word and rex is a quad register why the fuck do i have to specifically put q in here excuse me like i mean isn't it obvious that i want to move, move quad you're moving it at, into access xmm i guess well i mean but um, anyway sorry uh okay so I'm, I'm not an assembly programmer. I'm not an assembly programmer, so I don't know shice. It doesn't work, by the way. It doesn't work. So I don't really know what the fuck is going on. So, uh, yep. That is very poggers, isn't it? I think that's pretty poggers. Uh, one of the things we can try to do with this kind of thing, right? So we can try to maybe debug it, right? To see what exactly is going on in there, right? Step through. And just like literally see shift left. Well, it is shift left, right? So not, not shift right. That is definitely not shift right. Yeah, not shift right. Okay. Um, mm, 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 mm. okay, so let's just try to debug this. Uh, GF2 game. When in doubt, just debug it out. <laughs> when in doubt, just debug it out. Uh, boom. So, and here we're calling start. Honestly, yeah, so we probably have debug information and stuff, so... Okay, so we push our BP, so we're preparing some shice. Um, okay. Shift left, this is... This doesn't look like... Where is my code, mother flipper? So this is the runtime shit. God damn it. Uh, can I just break at start? Yeah, and continue. Yeah, there we go. Now we're talking. Look at that. Oh, it even shows me the names of these things because they have debug information and stuff. Look at that. What the fuck? The fuck? Uh, cool. Okay, so... Ooh, this one is... This looks sus. This looks sus as fuck. Like, what the fuck is this shit? How is that? Is, is it really floating? Mm. It looks like double. What the fuck? Wait. This is a flipping double. This is a flipping double. And by the way, if I just do double like this, is it going to be like 200 F? Um, so, what I'm interested in is what if I take this thing and reinterpret it as a double. Is it going to be 200? So that's a that's a cool thing. Okay, so I can do test. 
Um, right, and in here I might as well just do something like this. Uh, all right, and I can take uh, std int u int 64t, uh, and this is gonna be something like this. This is not even like blind reason. It yeah, that's that's weird. Um, mm -hmm. all right, this is the first one, and boom boom. And then we can do query replace space with nothing, boom. So we get that. And the thing we can do now, we can take a pointer to X. We're taking a pointer 97, oh, 69. Okay, so that doesn't look that weird anymore. So it's probably flawed. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you so much. Right, so we reinterpret it as a pointer to double and we dereference it. That doesn't really modify the bits of the original thing. It just reinterprets that as a different thing. And afterwards, we want to print uh, this stuff, right? So it's going to be LF, if I'm not mistaken. And hopefully, it's going to be 200F. Uh, all right, so in make file, we're not going to obj dump this thing. We can obj dump. Well, yeah, let's actually obj dump it. Um, so this is going to be test. Uh, right, it doesn't really tell us that much. Uh, except we can probably see some of. Nah, we, we can't see that. It's probably in a data section somewhere. Uh, and uh, let's just try to run. It is. It is 200. So that is really fucking funny. Honestly, that is so freaking funny. It was actually 64 bit. It's a double float. It is a double float. And I wonder if I can just do something like that. Can I? Um, all right. So let's do make B game. I can. Believe it or not, I can. Okay, so uh, let's actually kill this entire thing and refresh a couple of times and uh, start again, maybe run again. So we should probably have... All right, so that, that's weird. Um, let me restart. So, so it didn't help, by the way, right? So we can clearly see that it didn't help, uh, but maybe now it's going to be a little bit easier for us to, to work with this, this stuff break uh start uh then run and let's just take a look uh break but i mean this is not start is it start yeah okay so now it is start it is still like that it is still like that that's a good point okay so that's a good idea Th this is probably what we want to do right so yeah but i wonder if it's gonna it may the Usage of EIX, the 32-bit register, may force um, Fasm to actually use 32-bit float. It may actually force it to use that. Okay, so that seems to be working. And I'm going to kill this entire thing. And I'm going to just refresh a couple of times. Uh, so do I still have the breakpoints? Okay, so I actually lost all my breakpoints. Let's start. Let's run it and uh, continue. Uh, and look at that. 43, 48. Uh, so here they are. So yeah, thank, thank you. That's a good idea, actually. That's a way better idea. Um, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Okay, so let me now try the following thing. So this is going to be 32. Uh, we're going to be using float and we're going to be using just F. And what are we doing here? 43, 48. Okay. Uh, 43, 48. 1, 2, 1, 2. Boom. There we go. And I'm going to do test. And then I just run the test. It is 200, in fact. It is, in fact, 200. Unfortunately, I'm not on the level of actually parsing um, floats from hexadecimal. There are people like that. <laughs> right. So there are people who can take a look at hex of a float and tell you precisely what that float is. <laughs> as far as I know, one of the such people is Jonathan Blow. I remember seeing one of his streams where he literally crafted a very specific float by modifying the hex of it. I remember seeing that and was like, what the fuck? This dude on a completely different fucking level. Holy shit. <laughs> um, to anyone who thinks whether John Blow is a good programmer or not, he crafts floats from a hex. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> that's everything you, you need to know about him. Um, so... <laughs> 
I can't do that, right? So I definitely can't do that. Uh, so I suppose it may have something to do with like, um, you know, errors and stuff like that. So maybe he crafted like a very specific flow to reduce a certain amount of errors and stuff like that. But anyway. <sighs> so anyways, 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 anyways. Okay, so now these things should work actually, by the way, speaking of, speaking of, uh, so if we try to run this entire thing, uh, it still doesn't freaking work. Fuck you, leather man. Uh, and I wonder if this is because, you know what, what if we have to XOR XMM1 as well? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I completely forgot that I was experimenting. We need to actually shift left. That's right. <laughs> God damn it. It's one of these situations when you try different thing, things, then you figure out the actual root cause of the problem, and you forgot that you applied some different experiments, and these different experiments actually screw up your real fix, and it's just like, it's, it's one of those cases, yeah. Uh, right, it's just like one of those cases. Mm. Also, moving to AX zeroes out the upper 32. Fuck. What do we do then? Like, why does it do that though? That is bizarre. That is freaking bizarre. How am I supposed to even do that then? Hmm. Add maybe. Maybe. So, uh, yeah, adding, yeah, literally adding, and that will add basically bits or maybe or them. Yeah, let's actually use or. I think or is way better in that case. Okay, so you guys are right. You guys are right. Okay, so let me let me see. Still doesn't work. Still doesn't work. Uh, okay, let's let's try to debug that one more time. Uh, we, we're gonna we're gonna do that eventually. I, I believe in, in ourselves. So let me let me just try to do that one more time. Uh, that's that's the wrong thing. Break. Uh, start. And let's just run it and let's continue. Okay. So you know what I want to do? I want to actually step like through stuff in here, right? So I'm gonna actually go. Uh, in here, right? So I'm gonna step. Ah, shit. Why did it go? Ah, uh, fuck. Uh, why did it go? Yeah. Let's let's try to do that one more time. And it also killed the breakpoint. I want to do start. And I want to do run. And it stops at completely random thing. I'm not really sure if that's the correct thing to stop at. Right. And the, the only thing I want to do, I want to just do. Next, I can can I put a breakpoint somewhere? I, I can't put breakpoints in here, unfortunately. I can't put breakpoints in here unless I do something like break plus 63. Is that something I can do? Right, so it, it I can't do that. Okay. So if I just do an I, uh, all right. So one of the problems here is that an I is not gonna step through. Yeah, it's like all right, so I mean, I can just put that uh, in here. All right, so that's good. Finally, we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. Registers, show me your racks. Show me your racks. Uh huh. So let's take a look at the racks. Okay, we got that. Shift left. Okay, we got that. Boom. That didn't help. Look at that. It brought it back to this thing. Why would it do that? So, oh, because now if I want to do or, I have to do or with the racks. Yes. <laughs> oh, that, mm, I'm sorry. Um, mm. Well, I mean, that makes sense. I, I do agree with that. 
How do people do this without losing their insanity? Why do you think they don't lose it? Look at me. Like, I mean... Anyways. <clears throat> uh, so let's try to rebuild this entire thing so it does not uh, like that value out of range. Oh, and this is... So, okay, theoretically... We can put that into here. Okay. Did they crack the code? Did they crack the puzzle? I think I did. I think I did. All right. Boom. And... Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Holy shice. And it's actually super convenient. Look at that. It's actually a very convenient way to, to pack all of these things because I can modify these values separately, right? So I can make it sort of like a wider, right? So I can make it wider now. Um, so I can do, eh, no, this is not what I want. Um, oh, okay. So this one, so this is more of it like this, right? Oh, like this, right? So this is going to be width and this is going to be height, right? So width and height maps. <laughs> Uh, if I want to make it wider, I'm going to just do something like this. Boom. There we go. All right. And I can modify this stuff separately. That is absolutely cool. All right. So, and that also means, by the way, I can apply this kind of stuff to XMM0, right? So if I want to put it in a different position, I can do that as well, right? I can, in fact, do that as well. So that is a very convenient sort of paradigm within which I can modify things, right? So I'm packing the, uh, the stuff. So another interesting thing, we could have actually... Yeah, we could have actually stored all of these values into memory and we could have read all of that from memory, right? So another way of sort of like working with all of that, right? So I can move... Uh, so X... 100 and I can say that it's a D word, it's a double word, and then Y, right? So we have this kind of thing. So we moved it in there, and then I can say that this is the position, right? And position consists of X and Y, so this is my position, so to speak, right? So this is my position. And then I can simply sort of like read uh, entirety of this position like this, and then just like that. Can't I do that? I think I can, right? And we probably want to actually get rid of ink in here, right? So I don't think it's useful. So yeah, just like work directly with memory. All right, work directly with memory and uh, yeah. So I can actually put something like 500 in here. Uh, there we go. So if I try to run that, it does in fact work. We can put zeros in here, right? So this is going to be zeros. Uh, that's actually way better, uh, you know, way better way for me to work with that, right? So, furthermore, I can just do dq, right? And instead of x and y, I can say, okay, position, position, and then position plus four. That's another thing I can do, right? Position plus four, and then in here we can even have size dq as well and we can reuse that paradigm so that, that's way better than like messing with registers and stuff like that right um that's for sure uh, that's way better than messing with the register and i wonder if i actually wait a second can i do dw zero like this, and then size DW200. So then later, what I can do is just that. Yeah. And then just that. Move racks size move Q XMM1 racks. So can I do that? Does Phasm allow me to do that? It doesn't allow me to do that. Fuck that. <laughs> That's kind of sad, honestly. That's kind of sad. 
uh, that it doesn't allow me to do that. So I suppose one of the things I have to do is I have to do size. Uh, right, so D word. Uh, it, it's kind of weird because I, I thought that you initialize the value in here, right? That, that's the value that you initialize with. So I would expect this thing to be like that. So DD. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. I'm a dummy dum dum. Yeah, you're right. It's, it has to be DD. So that's probably why. So now. Mm hmm. Okay. Hell yeah! Look at that! Look at that! And it makes it so freaking convenient to work with, actually. It, act it makes it so freaking convenient because, yeah. For instance, if I understand correctly, when you multiply uh, stuff by XMM, right? So it multiplies all of the values within the vector. So if I want to multiply all of them by one value, it's going to apply to the entirety of the vector simultaneously, right? I think so. I think that's how it works. I'm pretty sure. Huh. That is so cool. I really like that. So, and essentially, you have position, you have size, and that means we can have velocity, right? Velocity. And velocity could be like, uh, let's say, 100, well, I mean, maybe 1,000, but uh, let's do something like five, 500 per second. Uh, so, and because of that, we'll be able to load velocity into XMM register, then multiply it by DT with a single instruction, and then add to position simultaneously. So we can work with them as vectors straight in assembly. Holy shit! That is so freaking cool. Did Raysan actually think about this kind of stuff when he was designing his library? Did he think that vector structure is going to fit entirely in XMM and operations on the vector? I'm pretty sure he did, right? So he's a very experienced software developer. I'm pretty sure he thought about all these things, so like at least to, to help the compilers to optimize stuff like that. Um... Ray Sun is so freaking based, yeah, he is. So, uh, let me see. What I want to do, I want to understand. Uh, so, essentially, if I have two values in here, right, so I can even maybe factor out this kind of stuff. So, we don't need this kind of stuff anymore. Uh, right, I have float x uh, to y. And I just like multiply them together. How would I do that? Uh, how would I do that? So let's go to make file, uh, disable all of the optimizations, right? So disable all of the optimizations and let's just do make minus b test. Uh, all right. Oof, maybe I should have enabled all of the optimizations, honestly. <laughs> um, okay, so, so here's the thing. I could have enabled all of the optimizations, but the problem is Okay, so you have to be careful with optimizations. If you just enable all of the optimizations, uh, it is going to simply... <laughs> it not only, like, co collapsed all of these things, it actually eliminated all of that code because it's not used anywhere. So you really have to be careful with this kind of stuff. <laughs> so um, one of the things we can do, we can simply print... We can call to a different function, maybe something like uh, get frame time and multiply it by two as float and just see what is going to happen. Just see what is going to happen. Uh, all right. So we get the frame. Okay, so that's fine. Um, so we're loading something. Oh, we're probably preparing. Yeah, we're preparing an argument for for the print f, right? So this is the string literal probably, right? So we're loading string literal into RDI, which is the first argument of print f. So we're moving um, one to ex, I don't know why. So we add together xmm zero. Um, all right, so why do we add together? Oh, I see. Ooh, that is funny. 
Freaking. <laughs> that is freaking funny. That is the funniest shit ever. Right, so. <laughs> I just edit them to get <laughs> times two. <laughs> um, I love it. Sometimes you look at optimized code and it's just like, holy shit, this thing is smart. <laughs> this thing is smart. <laughs> What's funny is that, okay, so what if I just do that? It won't be able to do that trick anymore, right? So it won't be able to do that trick anymore. So let's see. Um, okay, so now it does, in fact, it gets the frame time, okay. And then it multiplies uh, by something from the memory. So it probably took that... Um, you know, literal, right? So the, the floating literal. And it put it in the memory. So it basically multiplied it by this thing, which is good. I really like that. So we can just use mul ss. Uh, we can just use that. So that means, what well, that means? That means we can call get frame time, right? Call get frame time, then uh, multiply it by the velocity vector and then add that velocity vector into the uh, into the position and that will automatically be sort of efficient sort of uh, we'll see we'll see so let me let me see that would be kind of interesting kind of interesting so here's the rendering right so this is the rendering of this thing um, so we don't even need that stuff anymore, right? So we must add floating points. We must add floating points. We don't need these pesky integer registers anymore, right? So we leveled up. What's funny is that I unironically just leveled up, honestly. <laughs> Before the stream, I had no idea how to properly use this XMMs and stuff like that. It's just like, like yeah. Now I kind of get the idea, uh, which is super cool. Okay, so get... Uh, frame get frame time right so and well I, I don't have to put parentheses in here and now I have the delta time in XMM zero right which probably means that I can uh, mul ss XMM zero and then just just the velocity I wonder if I can do that Right, so it, we specifically say D word pointer, so it's a double word. But what if I say Q word instead? Is it going to do that? Is it going to do that? So this is going to be Q word. And then I do add position. So that means in XMM0, in XMM0, I do have the new position. What, is it that fucking simple? It's like th literally three instruction. Right, so multiply, add. That is so bizarre. Huh. All right, so, and after that, I probably need to save it back, but I mean, um, do you have to do that through racks? I probably have to do that through racks. Uh, um, you'd need CMD instructions for VEC math, probably. I probably have to do that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so th that's a good point. Um, so, mul, uh, yeah, we need SD. Scholar, scholar double 64. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just give it a try. I'm going to just give it a try first just to see what's going on. So, what I need to move? I need to now move um, XMM rex and then move position rex something like this i wonder if it's going to work so i'm going to just try to compile that and okay so it complains about 32 right so invalid size of the operand that makes sense probably because this one is not correct uh x86 uh, mul single thingy so it's probably for yeah, multiply scalar, scalar, single precision floating point. So it's a scalar thing. Um, let me find the other thing. Mole scalar. 
Multiply scalar double precision. We don't really want to do precision. Uh, unsign multiply. Maybe we have to do packed. I have a feeling that we have to do mol ps. I think that's what we have to do. And if it works out, I'm going to be pogged out of my mind, like unironically. Is this literally what we have to do? Holy shit. Okay, so it complains about some some stuff in here. Um, so invalid size of the operator. But what does it exactly want? Uh, and this is an invalid operator. Right, so move racks. So do you want Q? Invalid sim. Okay, so that's already cool. Extern. And it compiles. All right, so the question is, the million dollar question, where did I fuck up, fucked up in this logic? <laughs> right. Uh, did I fuck up anywhere in this logic? I feel like that could be actually good. So by calling get frame time, I get the first like lower float equal to delta time. Does that make sense? And this is where I fucked up because it's not going to be spread through all of the um, things in here. It's not going to be spread through all of the things in here. And packed actually loads up. Yeah, get them. Um, yeah, it's not going to work that easily. It's not going to work that easily. So we need a way to sort of uh, multiply all of these things. So, so I have one float in one cell of the XMM register. Can I? Okay, so yeah, yeah, I was looking about splat it. So you need to broadcast splat it to each component of the vector. Thank you so much, because I'm not familiar with the terminology, right? So now I know that it's splat it, right? So I kind of know what I want, right? I kind of know what I want. I'm just not familiar with the terminology. Thank you so much. Uh, right, so we need to do splat uh, broadcast. Load with broadcast floating point data. Uh, yeah. That's very interesting. It's probably not the thing I want, actually. That's probably not the thing I want. By the way, I want to actually see what is move queue and why do I have to use it. So double word, quad word. Yeah. Double word, quad word. Um, so I suppose one of the things we can do, we can just look at that in the debugger. Luckily, in the debugger... Oh, shit, we don't have XMM things in here. But what's funny is that you can see XMM registers in GDB, right? This is one of the things you can do actually in GDB. Uh, you can see the XMM registers, but for some reason GF doesn't allow you to do that. That's kind of weird in my opinion. Uh, add XMM to watch. That's a good idea as well. We can just add it to watch, but I would like to just see that in a register tab. So what I want to do, I want to just demonstrate how it looks like. Uh, right, so we can break on main. Just run, layout asm, I think layout regs, uh, yeah, uh, layout asm, uh -huh. fuck, <laughs> okay, um, oh, okay, so it doesn't display that either in here. I think, like, I have a phantom memory of GDB showing XMM registers, but I guess it's not really a thing. But one of the things you can always do, you can just print uh, XMM0. Yeah, that cool shit. <laughs> okay. I mean, why not, right? So if... <laughs> it basically shows you everything. <laughs> I wonder how GF is going to actually show that. That's very interesting. Uh, that's very interesting. So let's actually try GF. Um, right, so, eh, where am I? GF2, electric boogaloo. Uh, break on main. So main does not exist, it actually starts. Right, I was gonna, gonna run that. Uh, control D, continue. All right, so, and then if I do watch, I can do XMM zero. Yeah. 
that is a very convenient way of actually looking at the resist. Holy fuck. So, yeah, we can literally see. Oh my god. <laughs> that is way too convenient. What the fuck? <laughs> it has no business to be this goddamn convenient. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, like GDB shows us that, uh, but GF actually puts it into this structured view, which you can just like, like fold and unfold and stuff like that. This is so kind of freaking, freaking convenient. So if, if you want to use it too, right. So the, the source code of uh, GF is next uh, GF2. So I really recommend this thing. Uh, ne next, wait. Am I going? Oh, it's it's just GF. I'm sorry. Yeah. It is in fact just GF, just GF. All right. So let me let me. So maybe I'm gonna put that in the description as well. So this is the thing. Okay. So maybe we're gonna st step through in a debugger just to see what is going on. Uh, okay. So it should initialize the window. Okay. Let's hide the window. Uh, then, uh -huh. okay, we we'll begin drawing, whatever. I'm calling to the frame. Okay, so the first frame, okay, we don't we don't really have anything anything useful in there, but I uh, multiplied by PS and game received. Oh, that is very oof 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 oof. If I remember correctly. If you want to do this kind of shit, they must be aligned to sort of like some sort of a chunk or some, some, some sort of a page or something like that. I kind of remember that. And it's not just like a word alignment. It's just like, it's a pack align. They have to be aligned by the size of the pack, aren't they? I think they are. Right, so you, you, you can't just like do it like that. So I remember a long time ago, doing a little bit of a CMD in C++, not in assembly, but in C++. And this was one of the problems that I was experiencing, right? So that the, you can't just like do that from the memory unless the memory is packed aligned or something like that. So it's not really straightforward if you want to work directly with the memory. Um, so that is kind of interesting. And because of that, you have to allocate the memory in a certain way. I think there was like a mem align function. Uh, mem align. Yeah, this kind of shit. Yeah, mem align and everything. Um, so you can specify the alignment of the memory. Yeah. Aligned alloc. Alloc. So it's a part of ISO C11. That's actually kind of cool. So, yeah. Mem align. Yeah, exactly. Meme align, meme align. So, okay, you know what I want to do? I want to make a small break. I want to make a small break and I want to refill my cup of tea. After a small break, we're going to try to crack that thing and we're going to eventually do the DVD logo. This is going to be my goal for today, to make a DVD logo, to learn enough CMD scheisse to, to make a DVD logo. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty reasonable goal for today's stream. Uh, and I think it's going to be a pretty educational one. Right? I feel like when you sort of like a craft, like a very concise, very small, very packed sequence of instructions that does exactly what you want, it must be extremely satisfying. Right. Imagine like packing this entire logic into like few CMD instructions and it just works. That is fucking cool. Holy shit. And the fact that it just works with Raylib, like naturally, it's going to be even cooler. Uh, so anyway, let's make some break and... Um, all right. So you know what? I think we're going to cheat again for sin ISCD. So let's go ahead and just like try to code what I'm trying to code, but in C. Right. So um, I might try to maybe essentially do the following thing uh, i can take the delta time get frame time uh, and then i can take position x and make it equal to yeah maybe something like this so plus position x um, let's call this a velocity 
let's call this velocity velocity uh, x multiply by delta time and then w w that so here is an interesting thing if i crank up optimizations to the maximum we're not going to see scheisse in this mist right so because it's going to basically factor everything out except get frame time uh and you guys know why it didn't fact uh, didn't eliminate get frame time this is one that's actually really interesting why i didn't do that right even though it doesn't do anything it still didn't uh, you know eliminated it the reason is function an external function can potentially do side effects and the optimizer didn't want to actually you know get rid of those potential side effects so that's why it kept it but it removed everything else Right, it removed everything else. Uh, we can try to not, uh, you know, do that and essentially say, okay, we're going to print the position, the, the new position. Maybe we can even print the previous position and then the new position. Uh, right, so we can kind of try to do that. Uh, we can kind of try to do that. So if I just print the position, it's probably going to pre-compute everything at... Oh, this one is rather interesting. Oh, this one is doing interesting stuff. So I think maybe we can work with that, actually. Maybe we can. And look at that. It is doing packed operations and stuff. So move like PS and everything. I really like that. Huh. Okay, so we get the current time. Then we multiply that current time by that specific sort of like a vector but yeah maybe but it's a, it's only a single thing we're multiplying only a single thing uh all right so then i move two to eax i load this thing into rdi and i suppose this is going to be the thing that we're going to pass to printf so then i move oh i see so they're using pack to move to move the entirety of the yeah to move the entirety of the register to another register so they're not okay this is very interesting so that's how you move the entire register all right all right so we basically save the value of xmm0 into xmm1 because we need to clean it out right so we're cleaning it out and then we are adding cleaned out so we're adding zero to xmm what the fuck is this thing doing like, <laughs> look at this sequence of two instructions what the fuck is this thing doing <laughs> can, can anybody explain what the fuck is this <laughs> um this might be something to get around false dependency. I don't really know what that means. Um, anyway. uh, so this one is an interesting instruction. So CVT says to SD. Oh, it's a convert single to double. Right. It converts single to double. So there is. Okay. And it adds together these two things as doubles um all right so i really like this instruction i would like to actually learn more about this instruction so cvt aha uh -huh. convert a scalar single precision floating point value to a scalar double uh -huh. convert and this is probably the instructions i was looking for uh convert can i convert single to packed though Scale double precision to double. Mm -hmm. To double integer. Uh -huh. So convert scalar single precision to pack double. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't see this kind of thing. Packed double precision following to packed single precision. Yeah. Uh, there are like entire functions in one instruction. Yeah, exactly. So that's what's interesting about this entire thing. 
Uh, right, so I have a single thing. I have a single thing, and as somebody said, I want to splat it into like all of them, but I don't see an instruction that can do that. So there's a convert packed, so I can convert packed things. Right, but can I? So, and if I uh, search for splat, uh, spread. There is no such thing. Or broadcast. There is only one thing that is a broadcast, but it doesn't really load integer into... Uh, yeah, so this is probably not. So I feel like CVT, the class of CVT is things that we need. Uh, packed uh, S, SSD, stuff like that. Right. Uh, now... Dude, I didn't even know these instructions existed or so many of them did. You won't believe how many instructions there are in x86-64 and they keep adding more. They keep adding more and more and more and there is like extensions upon extension upon extension. It's just like it's fucking insanity. To the point that I think Intel like announced that they wanted to truncate some of the instructions uh, and stuff like that. Please share the page. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, just a second. I'm gonna copy paste it in here. It's a pretty well-known website. Um, well, at least this is the website that you're gonna encounter, encounter if you try to Google anything about x 64 instructions, right? So it's, it's pretty well-known, I suppose. Uh, and of course, I'm gonna put it in here. That's it's a good point. Thank you so much. Um, all right, all right, so I want you to take a look at the compilation in here. So we convert that to that, and that seems to be. So here I have like a full optimization. If I disable the optimization, I think it's not going to do packed operations. Holy shit. <laughs> Yeah, so I think optimizing like O3 is the good idea in here because I'm not fucking reading that. Fuck that. Um, yeah, so there's a... So the, it keeps using this SS to SD and I'm not sure. Convert the single single precision to uh, scalar double precision float point value and it... To a scalar double precision floating point. This is not what we want. Like, why would we do that to a double? That is really bizarre, in my opinion, but that's what we do. Um, that's what we're doing nonetheless. All right, so we convert that, then we're sort of doing packed add. Right, so it's packed add. Mm hmm. <clears throat> so O of 1, it's a good idea. Okay, so let's actually try O of 1 then. Uh, okay, it's, it's kind of the same. It feels kind of the same. So, yeah. So let's go through this entire thing one more time. We mu multiply the DT by something from from here. And I suppose that is something that we... Yeah, so it's from the velocity. So it's a double word. Okay. So then we move this thing, we zero it out, and we add this stuff. Convert XMM into that, and then we just add. I have no idea why we're converting single precision packed is it single precision to double precision and then doing double precision and then moving to i think i know why i think this is because print f wants that i think print f probably expects because we're printing that shit that's why so <laughs> Uh, that's why we're doing that. So what if I just draw... Uh, okay, so I think draw this position size, uh, you know, something like red, and we can have size in here. Okay, so that's probably the, the thing that we have in here. So the size is going to be that. Uh, for the position, I can actually add a little bit of uncertainty and get the mouse position. Yeah. 
So that's one of the things I can do. I can get the mouse position so the optimizer doesn't really do uh, anything, right? So people suggest in volatile. Maybe I should try to use volatile. That's a good idea as well. Uh, that's a good idea as well. So there's shifting around. Let's actually try O3. Uh, okay, so that's holy shit. That's very interesting. Uh, okay, so we move. We're saving the entirety like this thing into this stuff, right? So then we call position. Uh, all right so we move uh-huh this thing uh-huh so we'll multiply this thing by that move dqa Ooh, this one is interesting uh what is this move aligned packed integer values uh-huh Move aligned packed integer values. Uh huh. Shove PS at PS. It's too much, too too advanced. Too advanced. All right. So maybe we have to do something something dumb. Maybe we have to do something dumb. Maybe we have to treat it as a single thing. Mm hmm. Let's give it a try. Uh, so we probably want to uh, move Q XMM1 uh, velocity, right? XMM1 uh, velocity. Uh, and then we can move Q XMM2 uh, velocity plus four right so i know that is dumb and it would be better to actually pack them right i do understand them but i just don't know how to do that yet so uh then i'm gonna multiply a uh, single thingy um so it's gonna be xmm1 xmm0 xmm2 xmm0 so i sort of i take both of the components on here right so i take both of the components uh, right, so XMM1, XMM2, and I just multiply this by the thing that I have on XMM0, which is the delta time. Right, so that's what I have. So, and after that, I probably can do add single precision XMM1 uh, position and XMM2 uh, position plus 4. I, I still don't know if it's going to work, okay? So, uh, I'm just fucking around, uh, right? I'm just fucking around. Uh, all right, so, and that's pretty cool. And I wonder if I can, actually, probably not. I probably can't do that easily. Um, so, and then I need to save them, right? So I need to move MQ, uh, uh, right? So I need to have Q, and then XMM1, position plus four. So this is a very dumb way of doing that, but again, I just don't know how to do that, right? And it compiles, surprisingly. It's a little bit weird that it compiles, but uh, that gives me hope, right? That gives me hope. So let me go through that one more time. So X, in XMM0, we have DT. We're loading X and Y into XMM1, XMM2. So here's X and Y. We multiply them together, right? So we multiply them by DT. Then we add X and Y of the position to these things, and we're saving them back into the position. And then uh, we're essentially just like using that to render everything in here, right? So this is basically the rendering. I wonder if I can just clamp that together. I'm a little bit afraid to remove these labels because I think I'm gonna confuse myself if I do. Maybe not. Like, uh, maybe I'm not gonna confuse myself because uh, these labels kind of duplicate the names that I'm actually moving to Rex, so these variables can act as these labels, so I don't think I'm going to confuse myself. Yeah, that's good. So this is the rendering. This is the actual computation. This is the actual computation. And this entire thing uh, compiles, right? So it doesn't, at least doesn't complain. So, and I want to start actually by looking into the debugger, right? So I want to start from the debugger and just observe how the registers are going to change and stuff like that. 
So I'm going to break at start. I'm going to run. I have no idea why it stops in here. Like this doesn't look like start, underscore start. And you know what's funny is that when I do continue, it stops, stops the second time, but already where you would expect. So it's kind of weird. So I don't know, maybe this is because we mixed up different languages. So and part of the object files have um, debug information, but our thing that is written in Fuzzum doesn't have debug information. Maybe it has something to do with that. I don't know. Uh, you never know. So we have, we at least involved like three XMM registers in here, right? So we have XMM0, so here's that. Well, I mean, XMM0, yeah, XMM1, XMM2. Boom. All right, let's go. Let's create a window. So it will take some time. Let's hide the window. Uh, what else do we have? What else do we have? Uh, okay, so we get the frame time. So the frame time as of right now, it is completely zero. I suppose the first call to um, to get frame time gives you zero. So nothing particularly interesting. Okay, so we loaded up the um, essentially, yeah. We loaded up the, what's funny is that, oh, it loaded the whole thing, didn't it? It loaded the whole thing. It freaking loaded the whole thing. Huh. That is very interesting. Okay. So, and uh, then the next one is going to be all right. Yeah. So I should have not done keyword. That's for sure. <laughs> I should have not done keyword. Uh, but funny enough, it it kind of it kind of worked uh, worked uh, right. So what I wanted to do in here, um, can I do D? Yeah, that's what I wanted actually. I, I wanted to do D, uh, right? But at least we saw that in the debugger. So if I okay, so that seems to be working. So let's kill this entire thing and let's reload everything uh, and break on start um, and run. Yeah. Continue. There we go. Uh, da, 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 da. So here is the window. Uh huh. Then we continue. Okay, we do get time. It's completely zero. So we, we load the first thing. We load the first thing. So, um, yeah, so this is the first one. That makes sense. Uh, and then we load the second one. That makes sense. We multiply them. So that zero, you, can you see, you can't see Shaisa, I'm sorry, I apologize. So then I add things, all of that is zero, and I'm moving back into these things. And okay, so that, that looks cool. So essentially, I feel like I need to go through the first iteration of the event loop, right? And jump back uh, and go back into the get frame. And we are about to do get frame, uh, frame time. And now we're talking, right? So now it looks like, uh, looks like what I would expect. 38 seconds. <laughs> this is because we were in the, in the debugger, right? But overall, uh, right, we're loading these things into, into those things. Then we're going to multiply them. And this is our huge values, right? Because we waited uh, like for too long. And then we're going to add them to the position and we're going to save them to the position. And uh, then when we're loading them into the... Okay, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, so I think it's going to work. Okay, I'm gonna kill this entire thing. I'm gonna kill this entire thing. I'm gonna recompile the game and I'm gonna try to do game. There we go, that works. Uh, so that works without the, the thing being packed. Um, and I really like that. So at least we have something working. At least we have something working. So the speed is too much, right? The velocity. Um, the speed is too much, so I would like to maybe make it 100, right? So this is going to be 100, and let's actually give it a try. Uh, right, so we're going to rebuild the game. Yeah, now it is super smooth. So the reason why we're using floating points in the first place is because I can set velocity to very small, and it's going to be very, very smooth, right? It's sort of like it gets to the resolution of time, right? So. Uh, it's kind of difficult to achieve this smoothness with, with time if you're using integers, right? 
so because you need to be able to work with fractions and uh, you know doing this kind of thing allows you to work with fractions so this is the interesting part right so we tried to do move q and it actually moved an entire vector into move q so into the xmm which is exactly what we want which is precisely what we want. If we manage to find a way to get XMM zero and splat it right across, like make it packed across all of these cells, that would have been ideal and I can actually compress this entire thing. The question is, how can I do that? So I suppose we need to Google it up. Uh, right, so XMM uh, single float to packed, I think. Uh, move a single float into XMM register, yeah. So people were using the terminology splat, but I'm not sure if that's an official terminology. Can I use that terminology in Google? Can I just put splat in there? Uh, well, I mean, in their C equivalents. So we can just go through uh, some of these things. Uh, right. Trying to convert x86 SI to SD dq to this one is interesting uh you likely won't get an exact reproduction of the lower 60 okay so there is a dq to pd mm -hmm. no official terminology is broadcast i see convert packed downward yeah double word uh -huh. So let's try the official uh, terminology. Uh, broadcast streaming. Ex uh, okay, streaming CMD extensions. What about Google though? Uh, how to transfer a signal from into? F yeah, Google. Maladets Google. Black <laughs> suka. Sorry. Uh, how do you populate XML register with four identical floats? Uh huh. Shuffle. I remember shuffle. I remember these instructions. I remember seeing this piece of shice in the generated code. What is this piece of shice? Was ist das für ein Haufen Scheiße, meine Freunde? Haufen Scheiße, Haufen. Okay, so we need to. <laughs> uh, so where is this? Um, okay, packed interleaf shuffle of quadruplets of single precision floating point values. Holy shit! Uh, just just look at the description. Packed interleaf shuffle of quadruple, uh, quadruplets of single precision floating point values. Holy shit. Uh, what, what are the parameters? Okay, so let's actually see how you uh, you use that. How we use that. X, uh, okay. Shuffle PS. Ah, that is very interesting. Use sh shuffle PS as is, okay. Mm hmm. Select from quadruplets of single precision floating panels XMM2 and interleave results pairs are stored in XMM1. You can use downloaded Intel Intrinsic. Yeah, I probably can. Um, so I don't understand how to use this. <laughs> uh, wait, what am I looking at? What am I looking at? Um, I suppose I take the register, right? So I take the register and I just do that. But, but what is the third argument? I don't understand the third argument, honestly. Uh, CVT. So there's... Uh, let the compiler choose the best. Oh, okay, so this is the, to let the compiler choose the best way. Um, 
All right, I can just do this thing and this thing, but I don't understand. Like, what the fuck is going on in here, honestly? Is that the beats? Wait! So, V broadcast SS is much simpler. Okay, so I can try to do that. Um, I can try to see what the, what the hell is that. It doesn't exist. Broad, uh, broadcast. Well, I mean, load the broadcast floating point data. Okay. It's just like nobody uses it, and that's why I was not sure. Uh, broadcast single precision float in mem to four locations in X. It has to be from a memory, though. Right, it has to be from a memory. This is, this is not ideal for me. Because I already have a thing in XMM itself. But maybe there is a variant that is broadcast. It says broadcast the lower single. Pre oh, okay. So I can just do. Okay, I see. Precision in the source operand to the four locations in XMM. Okay, that is good. I wonder if I can do V broadcast. Oh, shit. This is like a legit instruction. <laughs> this is just like a just extraction instruction. Holy fuck. XMM0, XMM0. I wonder can I do that? Can I do something like this? Um that's a good question. Okay, so I'm gonna try to compile this thing. I'm gonna try to compile this thing. It does compile, that's already promising. Okay, so let's kill this shit. And uh let's refresh and let's break at start and let's just run this entire thing. Uh right, so uh, continue what the fuck i where am i okay uh let's refresh a couple of times uh break start run uh continue where are we okay so we, we kind of need to do one iteration at least right so that's kind of important so let's create a window okay fuck the window and okay we loaded the memory we did a broadcast Ah, fuck. Why did you compile it then if it's illegal instruction? Freaking fuzzum, my friend. Freaking fuzzum, I swear to God. So, because it... Ch okay. Uh, so, broadcast... Uh, broadcast the lower single precision 40 point in the source operand in XM... To four locations in XMM1. Okay, so that means we kind of want to do XMM. Uh, let's put XMM3 maybe. Right, I just want to see uh, if it's going to actually broadcast this thing. CPU too old. Wait. Is that AV? I thought that it's, it's a legal instruction because... Did you guys debate me? Freaking listening to the chat again okay so that means my cpu doesn't support that ah uh, fuck you stop kick doubling me okay all right i just want to shuffle some things and i just need to understand how to do that it's it's hard okay uh it's hard i want to multiply the data source by that blah 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 okay so load ps i can load ps um so this looks like the thing i want except i don't understand what the fuck is going on in here honestly like what so maybe i need to read what they trying to achieve in here i'm trying to implement some inline assembly to make an advantage I have some values 1 to 3 in the memory. I'd like to copy these values in such XMM as populated uh, 1, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So... And it doesn't make sense. It doesn't explain shit. <laughs> so... Uh, okay. So, shove PS, shove PS. Okay. I need to read. Uh, select single precision forward panel of input quadruplet using two-bit control and move to designated elements of the destination operand okay so select quadruplets of a single precision form plan in xmm okay so we're taking stuff from the uh single precision floating 
uh, plotting and using immediate value interleaved result pairs are stored in XMM1. So this is Select from CRUD rupees of a single feature in XMM1 and XMM2 using immediate 8 interleaved result pair stored in XMM1. So you store this thing. So there's a description. Select a single pair of input uh, using 2 bit control and move to designated element destination each 64 bit element. Lane designation. That, okay. Oh, okay. So maybe source okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is horrible <laughs> so okay i i don't understand a uh, chef ps example uh chef ps example and let me actually see why is it in russian why why is it in russian uh okay so, mm -hmm. okay, so let's see. Uh, moves two of the four packed single precision floating. Okay, all right, all right. Uh huh. Moves two of the four packed single precision floating point values from destination operate into the lower quad of the destination operate. Moves two of the four shuffled pairs. Uh, so that is, mm, I really don't like this thing, actually. I really don't like how it doesn't make any sense to me. So this is that thing, and this is the second thing. And yeah, I really need to actually sit down and like read this entire thing, like carefully. So that's, yeah, move to the four packed. Mm, okay, let me see. Shuffle person, maybe there is a better explanation somewhere here. Okay, this one is very interesting. What is select? Uh, select is the I don't know what is a select. I, I understand what is a destination. Destination is probably XMM1, right? So, destination is probably XMM1. Select 01, I, I don't know what is a select. So, it's not really pseudocode is not really helpful, unfortunately. It's not really helpful. Um, so maybe I just should start fucking around with this thing. Uh, first, first. You know what? What if I just like do first two times and just zero and see what's going to happen? So that's one of the things I can try to do. Right. So let's actually do shove. What was that? Um, I, I literally can't comprehend. I think I, uh, there's something wrong with my brain. I can't comprehend what that thing means. Like, I, I just can't comprehend this instruction. Like, I don't understand. The explanation doesn't make any fucking sense to me. It's just, like, obscure to me. I'm probably fucking dumb. Um, there are bit slices. I don't understand. Like, not, not, none of that makes any fucking sense to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry if that disappoints some people, right? So, but it doesn't make any fucking sense. At least at the moment right now, maybe I'm just in a different sort of state. Like, I don't don't even try to, to explain that to me. I just don't understand. Uh, all right, whatever. Um, so what I need to do in here is just that. Um, okay, so everything seems to be compiling, right? So everything seems to be compiling and we can break start and just run this entire uh, thing. All right, so let's continue. Um, so shuffle pass and I, I just want to observe how it behaves right so I just want to observe how it behaves unfortunately on the first iteration the data time is not going to be uh, useful at least we don't have an illegal instruction right so that's already achievement I think right so it doesn't all of that doesn't really matter right because the first time it's not going to be useful at all right so it's the second time that is very interesting right it's the second time okay so we got the uh, this thing. Did that work? Did that work? Um, so four floats. 
that worked. That spread this thing across four. I have no idea why. I literally have no idea why it's spread it by four. I have no idea how it works. None of the explanation make any sense to me. But maybe who who cares? Who fucking cares? Maybe that maybe that's fine. Maybe that will work. So <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe maybe that's fine. So that, that's my point. <laughs> uh, right. And essentially, what I'm gonna do. Uh, what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna move Q. Uh, XMM1 and I'm gonna move an entire velocity I'm moving the entire velocity uh, right so and then I'm just doing add PS right maybe not uh, not add PS but more like move uh, PS XMM1 XMM0 right so we're doing that uh, and then so we multiply them so in another thing we probably want to do is that uh, move Q XMM to position. All right, so something like that. We sort of prepare them. So we shuffle these things around. We load it velocity and the position into the memory. We multiply it, the velocity and the delta time, and then we add it together uh, like XMM2 and XMM1. And then the last thing we want to do, we want to kind of move the position back like so so that's what i want you to do essentially uh that's what i want you to do so is it going to work let's try to first compile it. it it compiles at least it does in fact compile again i still don't fucking understand what that means but if it works that gonna, that's that's going to be cool that's going to be cool actually uh right if it works so let's actually kill this entire thing uh right refresh a couple of times so break uh, start uh, so and let's just run it uh, let's continue there we go um, i didn't want to do that but it works so i want you to actually step through the debugger and see everything but i accidentally actually started this entire thing and it seems to be working so uh that means it's correct and I still don't understand how it works. I know that's going to enrage a lot of people in the chat who are hardcore low-level developers that are going to be screaming at me, like React developers telling me, Zosin, it's very simple, it's this weird thing, and it just works. I don't understand that. I'm that dumb. I'm really sorry. But it works. I found a way to actually make it work, so that's actually kind of cool. Uh, so, all right. All right, all right, all right, all right. So it probably has something to do... Like, my hypothesis is that... Okay, let's give it a try. Let's take a look at the sort of like a bits of this shit, All right? So let's take a look at the bits of this shit. Uh, I have the, the following idea. Uh, so if I do a binary of this thing... Okay, so it's that. It's sort of this... Uh, one, two... So you can imagine like an extra zero in front of this thing. So one, two, three, four. So essentially the pairs of bits, they might be actually corresponding to a single precisions in the pack. They might be uh, corresponding to single precisions in the pack. And if we do something like AA, uh-huh. So and FF takes both of them. So this sort of like bit power pattern probably indicates yeah that i'm not really sure like what exactly does it mean and why zero works in that case but but it works right so the beats probably have some sort of a meaning right the pairs of beats probably indicate whether we kind of include that, that thing or don't include that thing but what exactly does it mean so yeah, so it's probably uh -huh. this is unreadable. Like I don't understand it honestly. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> this is just I, I don't understand it. Like I can't. I'm that dumb. Anyway, so I think this works. I think this works. Uh, I think this fucking works, and it kind of yeah. Uh. I kind of get it from your explanation. Yeah, I also understand that we have two registers and we have control mask, 
and the beats of control mask kind of control what goes where and stuff like that but the explanation of exactly how things go doesn't make any sense to me like the, the small details like what like what move two of the four packed single precision floating point values from the destination operand aka first operand into the low quad, uh, quad word of the destination operand moves two of the four packed single precision floating point values in the source operand into the high quad word of the destination operand see figure 317 the select operand third operand determines which value are moved to the destination operand it's that fucking easy it's don't you fucking understand like my brain shuts off just from reading this like i it just shuts off like i don't fucking understand i understand that okay so beats control something but who the fuck wrote that excuse me who the fuck wrote that so select what is select is select oh the select oper okay so the language that they use in there, it's just like, it's so difficult to read. Holy fuck. Okay. So select is the third argument. Okay. We have a progress. Select is the third argument. What the fuck? Okay. Select one minus zero. What minus mean? Is, is that a range? Why is that a backwards range? Is that because we have a significant beats from right to, le to left? Is that why? <laughs> this is like, okay. So we select the first two beats. Oh, they're doing that sequentially. Okay, we sequentially execute these cases. Holy shit. We sequ okay. We go through the pairs Oh, oh, oh my God. Okay, so we're going through the pairs of this thing. And then we are... All right. If the first pair is zero, we're just copying destination onto itself. Right, if it's one. <gasps> it's an index holy shit it's an index so oh my this is so the explanation is so fucking bad oh my god oh my god okay 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 so each an individual pair of beats in the control sequence each individual pair of bits in the control sequence is an index from 0 to 4. 1, 2, 4. And essentially it tells you... Right, so, um, so this is the value. This is the value. And this is the index of that thing. So that means that essentially at the value index 0, you copy in the thing from the index one why don't you just explain that there, you could have explained that so much easier why did they choose such an anal way of explaining that that is so bad this is literally gatekeeping like i'm not even fucking this is straight up gatekeeping Like, it has no business to be explained so in a, such a complicated way. It's such a simple concept. Why did you choose to do it this way? I'm disappointed. I'm going to find you. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. This is a joke. Okay. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Anyways. Ah, so <laughs> I'm a Russian psychopath. I'm gonna find you, my comrade. I'm gonna fucking. <laughs> I'm joking. It's a joke. It's a joke. I'm a good person. Cheers. I understand everything, 
job security is important for well-being of an individual, right? So you want to make sure that uh, your source of income doesn't just vanish because some stupid Russian actually read and understood your paper. Like, you don't want that to happen. I do understand that. It is a respectable thing. I respect the hustle. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyways. Uh, like, at least we do that, like, in a pack, right? So we pack everything together and now it, it works, right? Now it works and, as you can see, we managed to do uh, this thing. And I'm proud of it, actually. I'm actually super proud of it. That's really cool. I learned something about CMD instructions uh, today. So it will be kind of cool to make them bounce off, but we already ran out of time. So I think that's going to be it for today. That's going to be it for today. Thanks, everyone, who's watching me right now. I really appreciate it. Have a good one, and I see you all on the next recreation programming session with Amista Azuz. And I love you. Mm -hmm. uh. All right, this is the next day, and I would like to finish this idea, this demo, where and, and make the uh, the bodies that we're sort of simulating to actually bounce off of the edges, right? So let's actually take a look at this entire thing, and here's the thing, and it doesn't really bounce off of the edges, uh, so let's actually change its speed a little bit so it moves a little bit faster, maybe like 200. I think 200 is going to be a little bit better, so I'm going to just do it like that, and as you can see, uh, it just goes off of the edge and nothing really happens. So how do I usually do the bouncing off of the edge? Right, so how do I do that in specifically in C? So let's actually write like a little bit of a pseudocode, uh, right, it's going to be uh, uh, sim, sim mode, and this is going to be the position, right? So let's imagine that we have some sort of a position. It doesn't really matter what it is. And then we have the velocity, right? So, and usually what I do, um, I do not do like this kind of thing right away, right? So where I take the current position and right away add uh, the velocity or multiply by delta time. And delta time is... Uh, essentially the you know the frame time get frame time uh, get uh, frame time I think that's how the function is usually called and uh, the same thing is for y I don't usually do that uh, and the reason why I don't do that is because at some point when the object goes off of the edge um, it essentially can become invalid, right? So it can go off of the edge, right? So if, if you just assign this thing uh, right away, uh, you may end up with an incorrect position. Because of that, uh, what I do, I sort of assign a new position to a temporary variable, right? I assign a new position to a temporary variable. And then I check if this temporary variable that doesn't go off of the edges. For example, if x uh, right, becomes less than zero, or x plus width of some sort of object, right, because usually it has like width and height and stuff like that, is greater or equal to the screen width or something like that, right? If any of these things happen, I do not modify the position x. I do not modify the position x. Uh, what I do, I actually modify the velocity, I make it go in an opposite direction. Right, I make it go in an opposite direction. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, I assign position x uh, to that. So essentially, first I compute the next x. I check that this next x is correct, and only then I assign that to an actual position. And if it is incorrect, I modify the velocity but keep the previous position. So that way, uh, the position always stays correct. If it was correct, it stays correct. So essentially, I'm just trying to go in a particular direction. And if I can't go there, I just try a different direction. So that's how I usually do that. And that results in actually bouncing off of the edges. But that uh, works for specifically for X. You need to repeat the entire procedure. You need to repeat the entire procedure for Y as well. Uh, right, so this is going to be Y. And here you also need to check Y, but use height of an object. Uh, height of an object and the height of the screen. Uh, all right, and of course here you have to use X and Y, of course. You have to use X and Y. And that basically results in the simulation actually bouncing off of the edges. So we need to do this kind of stuff 
but in CMD instructions, right? So essentially, I want to be able to do this kind of stuff on both of the uh, both of the coordinates simultaneously, because that's kind of the point of CMD instructions, right? So we want to do that stuff on both of the coordinates simultaneously. But it's kind of difficult because, because of all of these conditions, all of these branches in here, if you know what I'm talking about, right? So all of these conditions and all of these branches. So that means we'll need to think how to write uh, branchless code, Right, so the code that doesn't involve, you know, conditional jumps and stuff like that. And it's rather an interesting thing. And I already know how to do that uh, because I've done that before. And we'll try to translate that to CMD's instructions, right, and see how it goes. So that's basically the, uh, the idea of the, of the thing. So um, the idea the idea of uh, branchless code that we're going to use is actually quite straightforward, right? It's actually quite straightforward. So essentially, let's imagine that we have some sort of a condition, right? We have some sort of a condition uh, and we have a variable X that we can modify. Uh, so I'm going to actually use the assignment operator uh, as an arrow, right? So basically it ind indicates that I'm modifying this thing. So if I do something like that, I say that I'm assigning 10 to X. Right, and let's imagine the following thing. I have two variables in here, A and B, right? I have two variables in here, A and B. And what I wanna do, if condition, if condition is true, I want to assign A to X, otherwise, otherwise I want to assign uh, B to X, right? How can I do that purely mathematically purely mathematically, without using if-else, without using branches. How can you do that? That's a very interesting question, right? So that's a very interesting question. Essentially, let's introduce uh, an operator, right? So uh, sort of operation. If I put a condition in the sort of like a square brackets, what I mean is that if this entire condition is true, right, this expression is going to be equal to one, right? So this of true is equal to one and this of false uh, is equal to zero, right? So essentially, if I take a condition and put a square bracket, that means I convert it to an integer and then I can use this integer in mathematical operation. I think in math, in mathematics, there is a name for this operator and it's named after some sort of like a famous mathematician that I don't know. That's how fucking famous he is. Uh, right, so th does anybody remember how this operator is called? Right, where you can put a, you know, a condition into sort of like a function, into parentheses, uh, and uh, it just converts it to a number. I, I don't remember. Um, so maybe nobody knows that. But it, it is a thing that is sometimes used in, in mathematics, right? It is a thing that is sometimes used in mathematics. So and essentially, um, chronic delta, chronic delta, let me actually uh, Google it up so people say this thing. Uh, so, in, so in, there's also I versus bracket conversion, uh, right? So there is several people who came up with the same idea. Okay, so let's actually Google that up. Uh, chronic delta. Okay, so maybe that's what it is. I like. I don't know why they need to come up with such a pretentious name for such a simple idea. I have no idea why. Like mathematicians at it again. Like why do they always do that? Why the fuck do they always do that? It's, it is a, such a simple, dumb idea that we do in programming all the time and nobody wants to assign a pretentious name. It's a, it's a chronic style. Oh, I need, you need to have a PhD to comprehend that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why it cranks me up sometimes, uh, like, like this all the time. It's just like, what the fuck is wrong with math mathematicians? Like, we do that in programming all the fucking time. It's not a big deal. Mm -mm. Anyways, so, and how can you do that? Right, so, since a condition by itself, a uh, condition by itself is equal to 1 if, if it's true, uh, you can mod uh, multiply it by A. Right. And if the condition is true, this entire thing is going to be equal to uh, A. And if it's false, this entire thing is going to be equal to zero. Right. So this entire thing uh, basically becomes uh, like this. So if this thing is true, 
it becomes uh, A. If this thing is false, it becomes zero. So essentially you can use a condition, a condition to sort of switch on and off this value, right? So then you can take this thing and invert this condition, right? And sum them up together and then assign to X, right? And that's how you actually do this thing purely mathematically, right? So we can even check it out, right? So let's imagine that condition is true, right? So the condition is actually true. So this entire thing uh, becomes true. So that means this thing is false. This thing is one, this thing is zero. And that means this entire thing is A. Right, so that's what you have. Now let's imagine that the condition is false, right? So what's gonna happen if the condition is false? So we replace this entire thing with false. Uh, so this is gonna be false. That means that this entire thing becomes true. Uh, this entire thing becomes zero. This entire thing becomes one. So this uh, thing is switched off and you only left with B. So there is no a single branch in here. It's purely math. Right. So if you can do if you can do this kind of stuff, uh, you can basically write conditions in this branchless code. So this is sort of like a, uh, you know, quite common idea in writing shaders, for instance. Right. So because I, as far as I know, like in shaders, um, conditions are very slow. So people quite often transform their code to something like this to speed things up. Right. Because generally conditions on any hardware are slower. Right. So you you generally want to actually do all of the job in a sequences of just mathematical instructions that are executed linearly. Blend PS does this one, does this in one instruction. Does, is it supported on my hardware though? <laughs> right. So <laughs> because I, I do have a very old laptop. Um, so I'm not even sure if I, if I have Blend PS. Uh, blend PS, so a blend packed single floating point values. So all right, so it accepts three arguments and I'm having the shift PTSD, right? <laughs> so, okay, so this one is a register for sure. Then a second register or remember and some sort of a mask or whatnot, right? It's immediate eight. Select packed single uh, precision floating point values from XMM and XMM from mask specified. Uh, okay, I'm not going to use that. All right, so I don't want to deal with the shit. <laughs> Fuck that. Fuck that. Fuck that. All right. Um, interestingly, interestingly, interestingly. So what we do in here, uh, we take the position, right? So the position is this thing and it's two 32 bit integers, right? It's two 32 bit integers and we're just loading it into the single 64 bit and then we're loading it into XMM, right? So we're loading that into XMM. So what's funny, uh, what's funny is that I learned off screen, um, an instruction called move APS, right? Which allows you to actually move uh, like a, an entire packed, um, you know, an entire pack of floating points, right? An entire pack of floating points. So, and that means you can actually do that in sort of like a single instruction, right? So basically we're trying to load the position into XMM zero, right? And so first I load 64 bits into this 64 bit in, uh, like a register and then I load that register into that XMM wide 128 register. So we want to do uh, something like this, XMM zero uh, position, but it's not going to really work that well. It is not really going to work that really well because uh, so this thing must point at the 128 bits of memory. So in here we have only 64. So by doing that, it will load actually not only the position, but also the velocity because XMM zero uh, contains, uh, it can fit four floats, right? It can fit four floats. So, which is not like exactly what we want. Um, so one of the things we can do actually, one of the things we can do, we can just pad it right, with just zeros in here. And on top of that, we can just pad velocity as well. Uh, right, so it's easier to just like load this entire thing in a single instruction. 
and, and this is something by the way like if i understand correctly quite often done uh with the cmd programming right so quite often like you, you just pad and align things in a certain way so it's easy to use this sort of instructions uh right so uh, but we're not going to be using the upper like the you know upper things in here we are only interested in these things so we added this padding purely so we can just load it up uh with a single instruction so let's give it a try so we loaded the position like that right so we loaded the position like that and then uh we want to load uh, xmm one size like that as well uh though yeah maybe maybe that's fine so and, and that just looks a little bit better i think uh, so I think that just looks a little bit better. I wonder if this is going to compile. And that actually sec faults. That actually sec faults. You know why? Move APS has an interesting property. It cannot read from an arbitrary like uh, address of the memory. It it can't just do that. It it literally can't just do that. The only addresses it can read from are only the addresses that aligned by the size of the pack right so they must be aligned by the size of the pack so that means uh so you can only fit uh 32 bit uh four 32 bit floats right so that's the only thing you can fit in here so four uh 32 bits right 32 bits is actually four bytes uh right so that means the size of the pack uh, is 16 bytes so the addresses that you can read from are zero 16 and actually like multiples of 16 right so it's it's only going to be multiples of 16. so we have a little bit of a trouble in here so in front of the position and velocity in front of the position and velocity and the size and stuff like that we have this string with like a you know arbitrary size which is probably uh you know shifts around these things well, one of the things we can do we can basically assume that um, the loader, maybe the kernel, uh, puts the section in the address that is pack aligned, right? It's pack aligned, and let's put all of the things that we're reading the you know vectors from at the beginning. So all of them are pack aligned. So maybe this thing we also want to sort of like pack align this thing, uh, and that should probably help with act yeah, it, it works. That was the problem. This is the kind of shit you have to deal with if you work with uh, CMD stuff, right? If I put this title in front in here, it's sec faults. If I put this thing after in here, it works. That's the level of shit. That's the level of voodoo you have to deal with if you're doing, uh, if you're doing CMD. If you're doing CMD. Uh, so, and yeah, this is not only because of the assembly, by the way, you, you're going to be dealing with this kind of shit in uh, C, C++ as well, uh, right? You're going to be doing uh, with this kind of shit in C, C++ as well, because like, if you're just like loading from a memory that you just malloc, malloc does not freaking guarantee that it will return uh, the uh, aligned memory. Make you appreciate compilers. Compilers don't help you with that. If you're using malloc, if you're just like loading from malloc memory, the compilers won't do shit, right? You have to be conscious, consciously aware of that and use uh, memaline or something like that. I, I don't remember. So something like mem, I think it's a memaline. Yeah. So it's a all aligned alloc, right? So you have to use something like this, and you have to specify the alignment of the of the thing. Uh, right. Um, so yeah. That is something that you have to constantly think about. Uh, and that seems to be working. That seems to be working. And we really want to use this kind of operation because it just makes everything simpler, in my opinion, right? So in this case, uh, right, we probably, yeah, we probably want to, like, load these things as well in here. Can we just, like, yeah, so here we are getting that delta, uh, delta time and we're broadcasting that delta time throughout all of the... Uh, elements of the pack xmm0 then we're loading xmm1 and xmm2 and then we're just multiplying these things together and we're just moving this entire thing back uh like so right so that's basically what we do that's basically what we do and it seems to be working it seems to be twerking 
So, which makes me think, um, maybe we can even simplify this entire thing, because as far as I know, you can do these mathematical operations like multiplication and addition um, on the memory as well. So, the destination must be, uh, must be a register, right? So, the destination must be a register. Uh, let me actually see where is the add ps. Uh, yeah, the destination is a register, but the source can be either register or a memory, right? It could be either register or a memory. So that means we don't really have to load these things, uh, right? We don't really have to do that. So we have XMM, which is delta time, right? And I can do multiply XMM by the velocity, multiply XMM by the velocity, then add the position and there we go xmm actually contains the new position and that new position you can just save back into the uh into the variable position and that kind of simplifies the whole operation like this right it kind of simplifies the whole operation like this so and the code is rather readable right so you take the delta time you broadcast it spread it into several things then you multiply uh, you know, by velocity, right? So basically you scale the velocity according to the time, to the time frame that you've got. Uh, and then you add the position and you got a new position and you save the position back into the memory uh, in here. And you do all of that on all, like on X and Y simultaneously, right? On X and Y simultaneously. So, and uh, that doesn't freaking work. That doesn't freaking work. It's actually very beautiful <laughs> in the Y. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yesu, 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 that, that's, oh, because XMM, okay, yeah, yeah, there we go. So, and that actually, like, allows us to use few registers, which is rather convenient in my opinion, right? So, I, I generally don't like to use too many registers, even though there is, we have a lot of XMM registers, don't we? We have, like, 16 of them or something. So, we, we can go really nuts on uh, CMD instructions and, and everything. So, yeah. Mm -mm. So, I wonder, like, how much memory you can store purely in x86-64 registers, right? <laughs> uh, so, what can I Google up? How, uh, how many XMM, uh, XMM registers there are? And let's go to Google. Uh, so there are eight XMM registers available in non 64 bit modes and 16 in a long mode. And I suppose we are in a long mode, so we have 16 XMM registers, which allow simultaneous operations on 16 bytes. So that's pretty cool. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, okay. So um, what we want to do? What we want to do? So we need to start using this idea. We need to start using this idea for uh, for writing the code. So let's imagine that we have a bunch of things. So here we're going to have a position of the body that we're simulating, right? So P is going to be the position uh, of the body, right? So this is the position of the body. And V is going to be the velocity of the body uh, we are simulating. So it probably makes sense to also have the size of the body, size of the body. And uh, all of these things are vectors, by the way, like all of them are vectors, uh, X and Y, right? To be fair, their dimension doesn't really matter, right? So they can be three dimensional, four dimensional. It doesn't really matter. So they are just vectors and they represent basically a single vector, uh, you know, vector register, basically. Um, so, and we also need another thing, uh, we need the size of the screen, we need the size of the screen because we're going to be checking whether we're bouncing off of the boundaries and stuff like that, right, so let's actually call it like, so width and height, uh, let's call it W, right, so we have this kind of thing. So on each frame, how we do the simulation, we are computing the next position, we take the current position and we add uh, v multiplied by delta time, right? So delta time is a, you know, delta time, nothing particularly special. And we assign it to a new thing, right? We assign it to a new thing. Uh, all right, so it's called P prime, right? So P prime. But we don't really want to use all of the things for P prime, from P prime, right? We don't want to use all of the things for P, uh, from P prime. Uh, what we want to do, we want to check whether the new, some of these coordinates of P prime are actually correct, right? How can we check that? Well, first of all, we can, 
basically check if p is less than zero or maybe less and equal than zero so in that case we should switch switch the velocity right uh, and by zero by the way in here i actually also mean a vector right when i'm comparing things with a vector and i use a scalar in here i actually kind of like implicitly imply something like this Right, I, th I think it should go without saying, right? So if I use numbers in here, right? So that means I, I mean a vector where each component of the vector is just equal to that, right? So I think it, it just, just should be obvious. Um, right, so and we have a, this thing. And we can use it as a condition, right? So we can use it as a condition. And essentially, if this kind of thing has happened, uh, we should use the old, uh, the old value of the, of the position. We should use the old value of the position when we reassign the position. Otherwise, right, if this entire condition is false, right, if it is false, we should use a new one, right? So that's basically what we're doing here. That is basically what we're doing. So, and uh, we should do the same thing for the velocity, right? If this condition became true, if this condition became true, we should uh, flip the velocity, right? So we should flip the velocity. So we take the velocity, right? And if this condition is true, we multiply it by velocity and also multiply it by like minus one, or maybe we can say uh, minus velocity, right? Minus velocity. And for the uh, for the opposite thing in here, we use the uh, the original velocity. Can you see everything in here? I think you can see everything in here. So for the velocity, it's kind of interesting, right? Because as I already tried to do that, right? So we can just basically uh, sort of extract this minus one and we can see that we can move velocity into like out of the parentheses, right? We can move that out of the parentheses and essentially this entire thing will look like this, right? So it will look like this where we have this thing minus one and just this thing like so uh right so to be fair this condition makes a little bit too much noise maybe i would actually extract it out into a separate sort of like a variable let's call it c uh let's call it like something like a condition right so here we just sort of assign a condition uh and that way it is a little bit easier for me to do something like that maybe i'm gonna go with sort of like a regular expression notation and instead of like exclamation mark i can use like a, a hat uh so that looks a little bit uh more interesting and now it is kind of obvious right so that the thing that we can do in here uh, the thing that we can do in here is just basically the opposite of the condition minus this thing is is this is this some sort of like a known logical operation that we can have in here probably not uh probably not right so but that's that's one of the things we can do in here in terms of the velocity right so but we have to do this kind of thing not only when p prime is less than zero we also have to trigger the you know switching of the velocity when p is too big right so it's basically or p prime is greater or equal to the size of the screen but we also have to take into account the size of the body so we have to kind of add uh the size of the body in here and that's basically the entirety of the simulation that takes into account the borders that actually bounce off of the borders and everything so the only thing that is left in here for us is to code that in uh you know in cmd instructions right that's the only thing that is left for us to do so and that should be pretty straightforward actually right so p prime we already know p prime in here right we already know that it's xmm zero that's literally what we did in here so i would say that p prime is like uh, maybe i'm gonna put in here so it's xmm zero so that's what it is in here um and uh, so maybe it would be better to actually put uh put this thing first right so we computed this entire thing first and this uh, the second thing that we have to do we have to compute this condition uh right so we have to compute this condition um so yeah somebody says that we have to do minus s i think we have to do minus s L let me think about that uh yeah i think we have to do minus s or not 
No, I think it has to be plus. I think it has to be plus. So we have a position, but if you go a little bit forward and it overflows the... No, I think it has to be plus. I think it has to be plus, actually. Uh, all right, so maybe maybe not even equal, but anyway. So we'll see, we'll see. It's it's such a simple thing that is easy to, you know, switch. We should not rat hole about that for too long. All right. We should not have rat hole about that for too long. So um, let's start with trying to code this thing, right? So this is some sort of a comparison, right? In x86-64, uh, comparison is usually done with instructions called CMP. Uh, all right, so do we have something like a CMP on the packed, uh, packed things, CMP pairs? Okay, so that's basically what we have in here. Uh, okay, so it, ex oh my God, it just accepts this shit as well. <laughs> Uh, so it accepts three things, XMM1 and XMM2, or a memory, which is good, right? So that means we'll be able to uh, maybe just do CMPPS, XMM0, and then um, 0. All right, so where is my thing? So 0, but how can we, how can we do that? So can we, can we just have something like... Zero. <laughs> right. So XMM like 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 zero. <laughs> right. So uh, this instruction allows us to have a memory in here. Right. So uh, like otherwise I would have to do like I have to clean up XMM one, but I don't really like to use too many registers because it gets confusing very quickly, and it's just like uh, right. So it's just like man. Uh, and what is EM eight? Right. So compare packed single precision floating point values in XMM2 and XMM1 using bits 2, 0. Uh, so it's, I suppose, the, the lower two bits. So it's a range, but the range that goes from right to left because the, you know, uh, the least significant ones are on the right, right? So uh, as a comparison predicate, so this thing is a comparison predicate it is a comparison predicate okay that's very cool uh so let me see comparison predicates uh so is that a comparison predicates for processor with um some compiler assemblies may implement the following two operands to the ops in addition to three operands cmpps uh okay pseudo ops oh can i all right, so this thing sort of like denote the actual comparison operation that you want to have. Right, so this is less or equal. Can we have EQ? Okay, LE. LE usually in programming stands for less or, or equal. LT means less than, like it's just less. And uh, the uh, LE means, you know, less equal, right? So maybe we can just use this thing directly right maybe we can just use this thing directly uh, apparently we can apparently we can so that's kind of that's kind of cool so maybe i can do that and where does it store the result like where is the result um so perform cmd comparison packed single blah 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 uh result and returns the result of the comparison to the destination operand to the destination operate and the destination i suppose is xmm1 destination uh, the destination operand destination operand first operand is an op mask blah 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 whatever um all right so less equal and i suppose that means it's gonna store it in here which is gonna basically ruin our value of p prime right because we're kind of storing uh, p prime in xmm0 right so that means maybe we have to just move xmm1 xmm0 so i'm moving the p prime value into xmm1 and i'm doing comparison on xmm1 rather right i'm doing the comparison on xmm1 um so an xmm1 is gonna basically store this thing Right, it's gonna store this thing. So let me actually maybe split this kind of thing like so. Yeah. Uh, so maybe this one is gonna be like this. So this is XMM0. This is gonna be XMM1. Uh, maybe I'm gonna actually have 
two of them. So C1 is going to be X and M1, sure. Then the second condition is going to be C2, uh, like so, and it's going to be uh, X and M2, right, like this. And then the final C in here is C1 or C2, right, C1 or C2. So, yeah, we, we need to actually split them into at least like two separate registers so we, we can manage them a little bit easier. Uh, so let's actually see what's going to be the result, right? So it's kind of interesting. Uh, so let me see the result. The result of the comparison operator, the comparison result are written to the destination. Uh, each comparison result is a single mask bit of ones comparison true or zero comparison false. So I don't really know what that means. So let's actually rebuild this entire thing. Okay, so there is no sec folder or anything like that. So let's actually uh, open up the debugger, debugger wagger. So I'm going to do break start and I'm going to run this entire thing. Uh, right, I'm going to continue, of course. And let's actually step a couple of times. Let's create a window. Here comes the window, fuck the window. All right, then let's go and see how it's going to go. Okay, this is Chef PS, right? So this is a Chef PS and uh, so that means here we're doing, we modifying the position, right? So this is just like modifying the position. Um, update uh, position. So update the position. So uh, we basically broadcast this entire thing. We can even take a look at the values of XMM0. So XMM0. Uh, so what are the values is V4 floats. So might as well actually do V4 floats so I can only see these things as floats, right? So, and nothing else because I'm not really interested in anything else. And uh, so let's also try to do XMM1 v4 float, right? So we have some garbage in here, but it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so the garbage doesn't really matter. So, okay, we do multiplications and additions and stuff like that, and we're saving it back. Uh, okay, so I'm moving, so all of that is zero, right, initially, which is kind of weird. Right, all of that is zero. Is that because the position initially is zero? So maybe I should actually start with a slightly different position. So it's it's a little bit more interesting. Let's actually start with ten. So it's not like zero. Uh, I'm gonna rebuild this entire thing. Right, I'm gonna rebuild this entire thing. I'm gonna kill this entire stuff, uh, and I'm gonna refresh a couple of times. I'm gonna break start, uh, start, uh, run, uh, continue, boom. So, like let's create a window the window has been created we don't care about that okay so i got the delta time then i'm multiplying that by velocity doesn't matter it's all zero and then i'm adding the position so here we have we we see the position the initial position that we've got in here so nothing nothing particularly special okay so i'm uh, now moving the current position into x1 and i'm doing the comparison and i'm seeing if it's less than zero all right, so essentially it is not less than zero, right? It is not less than zero, uh, but for these things, so these things are equal to zero. And so this is the true. So this is the true, <laughs> which is rather interesting. So I wonder, can I see that as, okay, so th that's really funny. That is really funny. So essentially, false is all bits zero. True is all bits one. Do whatever the fuck you want with it, right? And it's not float. It's literally none. All right. Can I view it as none? Yeah, there we go. So if you convert it to float, it's it's none. It's not the correct number. So, but what would, what we want to have? We want the true to be one in floating points. Right, so that's what we want, um, and that's very interesting. So we can do another thing. So XMM can operate not only on floats. By the way, it can it can operate on integers. It can operate on integers. So you can view this entire thing as. Uh, let's actually see what kind of views we have. Uh, you can view it as uh, int thirty two for int thirty two, and all bits one is actually minus one because of the two's complement right if you never heard about two's complements uh, i really recommend to check it out two's complement right it's a way to encode uh signed integers in computers uh, complement 
Right. So, and according to that encoding, all of ones, uh, all of the bits equal to one is going to be minus one, right? Uh, so I think Ben Ben Eater actually had a pretty cool video on two's complement, uh, which explains really well how it works. So I really recommend that. So maybe I'm going to actually give you the link to to that video if I find it. So if you go to YouTube, right? If you just go, look at these huge ass thumbnails, uh, Ben Ita, Ben Ita Tooth Compliment, Tooth Compliment. Mm, yeah, Tooth Compliment uh, negative uh, numbers in binary. This is probably the best explanation of Tooth Compliment out you there. You might already I'm be familiar you. with binary. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna put it in in the chat, and for people who's watching, uh, it's gonna be in here. So. Uh, but that's already kind of cool. So because there are operations to convert integers in XMM registers to floats, right? There are operations. So that means at least we can treat this entire thing as an integer and convert it to float. It's not going to be one on the true. It's going to be minus one on true, which is already closer than none, which is already better than none. So that's for sure. So if I remember correctly, the operation that does the conversion is, they usually start with CVT, right? So all of these operations, they start with CVT, so which means convert, uh, right? So, and what we want is probably convert double word integers to packed double precision, actually single precision. So we probably need this operation. Uh, yeah, there we go. So convert packed double word integers to packed single precision floating point integers. Uh, that's the operation we need. <laughs> Welcome to x86-64, everyone. <laughs> Where we have such instructions as simplips and cvt ductus. So, yeah. <laughs> if you're coming from those times where you had to do move ax0, move bx0, Get out of here! This is a modern x86-64. That's how you program an assembly today. It's not even that modern, by the way. This is like very old, uh, like instruction set. There is even more like modern instructions and even longer ones. So yeah. <laughs> uh, so the future is now, old man. Um, so. How are we going to be doing that? So I think you can actually use the same register to, as the destination, as the source and the destination, I'm pretty sure. So you can do something like this. Right, I'm pretty sure about that. So yeah, is it going to compile even? So let's try to compile. Uh -huh. It does compile, right, well, look at that. So it does in fact compile. So let's kill this entire thing and I'm going to refresh the GDB and I'm going to break on start one more time and boom. Let's continue, uh, and we are in. So let's create a window. The window has been created, and let's continue debugger logging. So here is shuffle, right? So we shuffle and update things around, and here comes the most interesting thing. So we're doing the comparison, right? So we're doing the comparison, uh, and the result of the comparison, as you can see, it's this nonce, right? It's this nonce, and we're about to convert it from integer from integer into the float. So now this entire thing should turn into minus one, minus one. So there we go. Isn't that a bonus? Isn't that a bonus? I think that's pretty freaking bonus, my friend. It's fucking bonus. Das ist bonus, my friend. Das ist bonus. So, but now we want to have one, I suppose. Uh, we want to have none. We could try to incorporate negative into sort of these operations, right? So we can sort of like assume that this is going to be minus. And maybe for that, for this thing, it's going to even kind of work. Um, but so we can just like, yeah, if everything, both of them are going to be minus, eh, it's kind of difficult. I think I don't want to do that. Yeah, I think I don't want to do that. So <laughs> let's just like actually do a very dumb thing where I'm going to have minus one. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, so let's just do something like this. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. 
And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just multiply XMM1 by uh, minus 1. There we go. Uh, mm, so, <laughs> um, so welcome to assembly programming. So we ha we have zero, uh, and we have minus one. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so let's let's see. So that should result in like the condition converting the con uh, the condition into zero or one, depending on whether it's false or true. Uh, right, so that that should work out. I think. I think that should work out. Anyways, anyways, mine for in the anyways. So uh, let's rebuild everything and let's actually step in the debugger. In the debugger. So break start, run, continue a couple of times. Create the window, a la window, and let's step one more time. So uh -huh, we're about to do the comparison so this is the comparison this is the result of the comparison we converting this thing into like from integers into floats and we multiply it by minus one and we get <laughs> fucking i triple e seven five four floating points i swear to god <laughs> but i mean it shouldn't really affect fucking <laughs> if you take zero and multiply it by minus one, you get minus zero. <laughs> you get minus zero. So that that's yeah. So I wonder if that actually kind of works in 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 here. So multiply by minus one. Yeah, you get minus zero. So Python be like. Um, well, I mean, it's not about Python. It's about uh, how computers work, actually. So. <laughs> Forget everything you learned in, in math, right? Forget everything. So math doesn't work in computers. It's just like it doesn't fucking work. Like forget everything. We have negative zeros. Uh, is minus zero equal to zero? That, that's a good question, actually. That's a good question. So let's actually see. Uh, so this is that, Python 3. So if I take this thing... Yeah, it is. Uh, I wonder if I... If I do zero multiplied by uh, minus one, yeah, they are equal apparently. Bizarre, isn't it bizarre? Minus one, isn't that bizarre? triple e seven five four um so yeah another thing that we probably need in here is actually the opposite um right so we kind of need the opposite thing and i wonder how we can do that mm -mm. so is there any way to invert all of the beats so essentially uh this is going to be XMM1 and the, um, yeah, we also need to store the opposite one. We also need to store the opposite one. But I suppose, yeah, we're going to use XMM1 and XMM2. And then we're going to or these two things together back into XMM1, right? So I think, yeah, so XMM2 is going to be sort of like a temporary thing. I think that's a, that's a good idea. Is going to be a temporary thing and you know what let's actually not work with that stuff for now so i want to use a sim c mod but unfortunately c mod reacts to this thing really really badly so okay, what can i use can i use husky mod can i use husky i can okay <laughs> yeah i can probably use husky mod so let's actually use husky mod for this kind of thing uh, right, because I want a visual separation between uh, comments and not comments, right? So, because sometimes it's it's kind of difficult. Uh, that's what you get for using Haskell, I suppose. That's what you get for using Haskell. Um, so, can I use a camel mod to... 
It keeps shitting warnings to a rec mod. Okay, fuck you, husky mod. It, it keeps shitting warnings. That's what you get for using Haskell, I suppose. All right. <laughs> um, it just keeps shitting warnings. So there, there's this thing. Uh, let's kill all GDB. Yeah. Uh, mm -mm -mm. And I didn't save my, my math. I actually saved it in a temporary buffer, but I killed the Emacs and now I lost it. I should have saved it to a separate text file. That's what you get for using Haskell, by the way. The moment you enable Haskell mode, everything falls apart. Emacs starts shading warnings. You lose all of your progress. Fuck you for even thinking about using Haskell. For even implying a little bit of Haskell. Fuck you, that's what you get. Uh... Okay, so let's make a small break. Um, all right, I'm back and I recovered my notes that I actually lost to Haskell mode, so we can actually continue, luckily. So this time I'm not using Haskell mode for highlighting, I'm using OCaml mode. And because of that, we have shady comment, uh, right? So because OCaml only supports this kind of comments, right? Which is kind of weird, but it is what it is and it isn't what it is. And OCaml itself is rather weird uh, language, right? So let's open game, uh, Azam, and uh, let's continue slapping the coot. Uh, let's continue slapping the code. Uh, so here we have the first condition. So maybe for now, I'm going to ignore the second condition. Let's actually try. Why did you fucking jump in there, you stupid? Mm. Uh, right. I just wanted to comment it out. I swear to God, if you're gonna. Okay, so we didn't. Why the fuck do you need to jump there? Like, why can't Emacs mode calm down and just not do weird shit all the time? <laughs> anyways, uh, anyways, anyways. Can your Vim do that? Exactly. Can your Vim do that? So uh, essentially, we're gonna just like a, like work with uh, you know this condition, right? We're gonna only check the left upper border right so we're gonna check only that and because of that maybe it makes sense to like for us to move in an opposite direction so as you can see we're moving uh, right and down which we're not really checking the collision with right so we, it probably makes sense for us to actually move left and up and up so we can check the collision faster so let me actually rebuild everything super quick and see if it compiles and i'm going to start the game and as you can see, we're moving down. So uh, I think we need to start maybe at 100, uh, 200, somewhere here. Uh, this is not what I want. Uh, right, somewhere here. Um, so maybe, maybe even, yeah, something like that. And the velocity is probably has to be um, negative for both of them. So let's actually try to do that. Yeah, as you can see, we're going there. So that's cool. So we're going there. That's pretty epic, minor throwing there. That's pretty epic. So, uh, now, the next thing. The next thing that we have in here. Uh, so I need to take the old position, right? So I need to take the old position. And essentially... Yeah, I need a variant of the condition that is actually negative. I need to sort of negate this thing. I wonder how can I do that? I wonder how can I do that? So uh, I already did the comparison, right? I already did the comparison. But one of the things I can do, I can move APS XMM1 into XMM2, right? Uh, and as you can see here, we did the conversion and then just that. So what I'm thinking is that we need to uh, sort of negate these things. Is there something uh, invert? How can you invert the bits? How can you invert the bits? Inverse not PS. I don't really know how to do that. So I've, I've got a better idea, actually. <laughs> uh, I've got a better idea. So what if I move XMM 
to into XMM1. So I just like copied it. Um, maybe I'm gonna move one into XMM2 and then sub PS XMM2 XMM1. That's how I'm gonna invert. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't say anything. Don't, don't say anything. Okay, okay. Zor the beats. How Zor is going to help me? Um, is it? Oh, maybe maybe Zor in the beats is actually a good idea. Yeah. So people suggesting to Zor. Okay, I can Zor these things. Yeah, I can Zor. If I Zor things with itself, right? So it is going to. Hmm. I'm not going to do anything. Mm, whatever, whatever. I already made made up my mind. Uh, so yeah. So move APS. All right. So it's gonna be that. Uh, move APS. Okay. So I move this condition. I compare it to zero, and we we'll just do that. Okay. Mm hmm. So then I invert this thing, then I invert this thing. So let's try to recompile this entire stuff. And I'm going to try to maybe GF2. Uh, right, so let's break, start. Uh, and let's also run it, of course. Let's also run it. I wish there was a way to like jump straight into some certain place, but I mean, I don't have a debug information. I don't have a proper debug information there. So, uh, right, so let's continue. Okay, so let's start the window. Uh, yep, and uh, let's do that. So I probably need to have a view on this XMM things, like XMM zero v four float. Uh, right. So this is going to be that XMM one and XMM two. So we don't have three yet. So that's totally fine. Okay, so we did the multiplication and stuff like that. Okay, so we're about to do the comparison. The comparison is fine in here. We're converting that to uh, floats and stuff like that. We multiply it by minus one. That becomes this. And uh, so we move that thing to that. We subtract this thing. And there you go. In XMM1, we have one thing, one condition. In XMM2, we have an inverted condition. Right, so... And that's the things that we can use in there, right? So that's the things that we can use, which is kind of cool, I suppose, right? So this is the one condition, that's another one. All right, so uh, we can work with that. We can work with that. So I would say that, uh-huh. So, and then we also have an inverting one and inverting one is gonna be XMM2. All right, so I wanna just keep these things like that, so. So the this one is XMM1, this is XMM2. Uh, all right, so, and I suppose now we need to take these parts and compute them separately and sum them up separately as well, don't we? Mm -hmm. Well, we already kind of have P prime in XMM0, which means that we can multiply it by XMM2, can't we? I think we can. <clears throat> and then we can... So it, what's interesting is that we can't really destroy neither XMM1 or XMM2, right? We can't destroy that. Uh, so that means we have to maybe have XMM3, XMM4, where we're going to store those things, right? So that's probably the things we have to do. Uh, so, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so we update the position, uh, check collisions, right? So we check collisions. So this is not really update position. This is the next position. We compute the next position. Uh, right, so here we're checking the collisions. We're just checking the collisions. Uh, and here we're just rendering, right, rendering. Uh, and here we're gonna do something else. Uh, we're gonna update the position, right? So this is the, yeah. So we're gonna update position. 
and separately we're gonna have update velocity i suppose right so because as you can see here uh we are updating the velocity too uh, so uh, xmm one and two so the condition is one and two so let's have xmm3 let's move aps xmm3 so this is the old position right so this is the old position so i take the old position and i'm loading it into xmm3 and then i'm uh moving aps uh xmm4 xmm0 and this is the updated uh p prime position so this is that so and then here i'm going to be multiplying uh, xmm xmm3 and multiplying xmm3 uh, by the xmm1 right so that's the first one and then i'm multiplying um, xmm4 uh, by xmm2 right and then i need to add those things together right so i need to add them together now um, so I can actually do add PS XMM3 and XMM4, right? So I added them together. So, and that's the new position, right? That's the new position that I probably want to actually save uh, into position in here, something like this. So, yeah. <clears throat> mm, so maybe I can reassign it like this. Maybe not. I'm not sure if that's a good idea. So xmm3 is this expression xmm4 is this expression so essentially i'm loading the old position into xmm3 i'm multiplying it by the this condition which is in xmm1 we can clearly see that it's an xmm1 and thus i computed this thing then i'm loading xmm0 into xmm4 xmm0 is actually p prime then I multiply it by XMM2, which is the inverted condition. We know that it's inverted condition, and thus I computed this thing. Then I add XMM4 into XMM3, and thus I computed this entire thing, which is the new position with some of the positions modified according to the condition. And I just save this XMM3 back into the position. So, And uh, all of that automatically does this, like, if, else, and everything, right? So, but without the uh, checking the right bottom corner right without checking the right bottom corner all right so this one is cool and everything but what about the velocity so in case of the velocity this is an inverted condition inverted condition is stored in xmm0 xmm2 so we can do sub ps xmm2 and we subtract in xmm1 thus we computed this thing we computed this thing and it's stored in xmm2 right it is stored in xmm2 so that means um, we can probably multiply by velocity, but we don't really have velocity anywhere. The velocity is not restored anywhere right now. Mm. But we kind of have XMM3, right? So we can basically move APS uh, XMM3, XMM3 velocity, right? So XMM3 velocity, then I basically multiply XMM, uh, XMM2 by xmm3 uh right and so i multiplied together this difference and the velocity right i multiply them together so i can now save back uh save back the velocity in here so it's gonna be xmm xmm2 actually so xmm2 uh and yep yeah, so that should be enough right so this is updating position this is updating the velocity here we just check in the collision. So there's no a single branch in here. So that's what's cool about all that. There is a comparison, but there is no single branch. Uh, right, then we're updating the position, updating velocity, and we're like operating an, on X and Y simultaneously. That's quite important. We're operating on X and Y simultaneously. Does it compile? It does in fact compile. It does in fact compile. So we can try to maybe run this entire thing, and it does in fact fucking work. <laughs> so so this entire idea with uh you know with this kind of stuff actually works uh so we, ju we just need the second condition now right so we just need to compute the second condition somehow uh right so then we can bounce off of the uh, of the right edge right so we can bounce off of the right edge 
Uh, so, and uh, here's an interesting thing. So we need to know the size uh, of the of the screen actually right so we need to know the size of the screen so how can we compute the size of the screen so if we take a look at the ray leap get screen width this thing returns integer right so that means we need to pack it into the into the floats and stuff like that right so we'll need to pack it uh so if we try so at the beginning of the loop in here right so at the beginning of the loop we just call get screen uh, screen width. Do we even have screen width? I, I don't think so. Screen width. Uh, so we don't have that. Okay, so let's actually mark it as external. Get screen width and also height as well. Right, so we'll need both of them. Since it's an integer, right, so it's probably returned through racks, right? So we have this shit in racks. Um, you know what I'm thinking? actually you know what i'm thinking we probably need another thing in here uh another thing in here and this thing is going to be something like um border right and it's going to be actually a bunch of these things as well right so it's going to be a vector that we're going to be working with and uh essentially i can then move uh this racks into border and that's the x of this thing right then i can call to uh height a height and then I can move to border plus four, right? Because there are four bytes, if I'm not mistaken, right? So there are four bytes. So we can just like save this entire thing into here. And here is an interesting part. Since it's a proper vector, it's a proper vector, I can just load this entire motherfucker into XMM register, all right, like this. I just loaded this entire thing into XMM register, but it's integers. But we already know how to convert integers into floats. So I can just do this kind of shit. XMM zero, uh, XMM zero, XMM zero. And I can then save this motherfucker back into the border, like so. Uh, so getting the border that's pretty cool so i just get them separately i collect them i sort of like pack them into the memory and then i just use these things to convert it into like a float pack and whatnot uh so let's actually see how it works it's, it's kind of cool actually uh so let me let me see so i'm gonna just kill this entire thing i'm gonna refresh break start and let's run this entire shy sung shy sung so we probably want to also take a look at racks right so we want to take a look at racks so racks is al uh, actually kind of wild right now so yeah. uh -huh. we're about to call get screen width look at that we're about to call get screen width so a boom so we have uh, you know 800 in uh, in racks so we actually save it into the memory okay we call get height now it's 600 as you can see okay we move it into the memory and now i'm loading all of that shit into access xmm right as you can see in xmm we have some garbage in floats right this is straight up garbage but this is because they are integers so now i'm going to uh, convert integers to floats and there you go in a pack of floats i have 800 and 600 so now I can use this border as the vector, right? I can use it as a vector. And I'm moving it back into the memory so later I can actually go back to it and maybe use some conditions and stuff like that. Hmm. So, yeah. Mm, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So there's no, like, get screen width and get screen height that, like, return your floats right away. You kind of have to, like, take them from integers, unfortunately. But that is fine. That is fine so okay so we get the next position so we're computing sort of p prime that is cool right so the next thing so we did the conversion and everything so this is the first cmp so this is the first cmp uh we loaded p prime which is in xmm0 right so it is in fact in xmm0 because here it is so it's it's here into xmm1 and we compared it to zero okay so now i want to take p prime and load it into xmm2 so uh, it's going to be xmm2 uh, 
um, yeah, x m m two, x m m zero. So now I have this thing in here. I need to now add size of the object. Do I have size? Yeah, I do have size. Okay, so here is the size of the object. So I've got this thing. I've got this thing. And now I need to compare uh, LPS this thing with the border, right? So the border is basically this W. It's the size of the window. But I have to compare it in opposites, right? So it has to be... Like, I, I can do maybe like this. So I can use this operation and I can just negate it. Uh, as far as I know, uh, so there is a CMPPS and there is like an opposite of that. CMPPS uh, and there is just an opposite of that. So, yeah, you can just put N in front of it, right? So you can just put N. Oh, and it, it, it is correct. So I put M. Okay, so we can put N. N is just like negative. What's interesting is that I didn't do any conversions to floats or anything like that, right? I didn't do any conversions because now I can just XOR PS this entire thing. So it is, it does in fact exist. So let me actually read more about XOR PS. How many uh, arguments does it have? I don't remember. It has two arguments, which is which is quite convenient. So we can do XMM1 into XMM2. So essentially, it works on a level of bits, right? So here, I didn't do any conversion. I just ORed. Actually, not SOAR. We need OR bits. ORPS. Yeah. ORPS, ORPS. ORPS, ORPS, ORPS. Uh, so yeah. OK, so this is a single condition. And in here, we're going to be converting this single condition into the um, what is it called into the floats, right? So we're going to be converting into integers, then we're going to be multiplying by minus one, then subtracting one and stuff like that. So yeah, this one like computes both of these conditions in here, right? It computes both of these conditions. And theoretically that should check now all of the borders, all of the four borders, hopefully. So let's actually see if this entire thing compiles. Uh, all right, so, and let's just run this entire thing. It bounces off of these things. It bounces off of that thing. So, so it's kind of, it is kind of cool. There's not a single branch in here, and we're checking all of the um, components of the vectors simultaneously. We're checking all of them simultaneously. But here is an interesting part. Here's an interesting part. There is a little bit of an overkill in here. We have, uh, we only need two components in the... <laughs> okay. We need only two components in the vector, right? So we only need two components. But we're actually checking four of them simultaneously. Uh, we're actually checking four of them simultaneously. So, yeah, that's kind of actually kind of funny. Why does it actually get stuck sometimes? That's really interesting. But anyway, let's, let's ignore that. <laughs> let's ignore that. Mm -mm. Yep. We can get a second rect for free. Uh, let me see. How can we even do that? So, essentially, we start with this sort of position. I wonder if I can do something like this right so this is going to be the second rectangle and in here we can just do like maybe 100 and maybe 200 right so and we can even have like a separately separately controlled size so this thing can be like 100 um so yeah so for the border for the border i think when we're loading the border actually when the ah you know what I think I know what the fuck is going on, chat. I think I know what the fuck is going on. So we probably should have done something like this. So yeah. <laughs> uh, right, because we're, yeah. So it was actually doing 64 and maybe that's actually caused this thing being stuck sometimes. Right, so that's probably what, uh, you know, it you know caused this thing being stuck sometimes. Um, so essentially, what we need to do when we're loading the border, like we're loading the information only for the first two things. 
Now, to get the second rectangle for free, we need to duplicate this thing in here. We could just use shuffle thingy, right, but I still don't quite understand how to use that. So I think the thing I'm going to do in here is actually uh, like this, right, plus eight. <laughs> don't judge me, I'm too dumb for this shuffle shit, okay? I'm too dumb for this. <laughs> I'm too fucking dumb for this. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, is it? Oh, is it? It's probably twelve. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we can even test how it is going to work in the in the debugger wagon, right? So let me see. Let me see. Uh, so I'll already kill that, and let's refresh. Let's break on start. Let's run and continue. Boom, 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 boom. I want you in my room. Uh, let's spend debug together, together in my room. Okay, so we loaded this kind of shit, we loaded this kind of shit, and I'm... Uh-huh. And look at that. So, we've got this thing, and it actually, uh, you know, did that. That's pretty cool. That is a pretty, pretty cool. So, and that is basically it, I think. So, we don't really have to even really modify anything in here honestly in the logic itself the only thing we need to do we need to like modify the rendering rect one right and let's just do uh rendering rect two right and essentially what we have to do in here we have to just like skip uh 64 bits right so two 32 bit floats right so this is the second rectangle because we were drawing this thing now we're gonna also draw this part of the of the vector right we're also drawing that so and maybe for this thing we're gonna even use a different color to sort of emphasize that we have different things in here uh, and now if i try to run this entire thing it's sec faulted surprisingly i wonder where exactly it's sec faulted so uh yep so if i don't do that right so it's it specifically sec faulted somewhere here right yeah it's specifically sec faulted somewhere there so it didn't like me doing this stuff so is it uh-huh ah i think i know because move aps only can do aligned read so we literally have to do the Q, the Q thingy that we removed in here. So let's actually do the Q thingy. Right, because we, we're going to be loading, like, you know, from the middle of memory. So we can't do unaligned things. Uh, we can't really do unaligned. There we go. And they're stuck for some reason. Why do they get stuck, honestly? That is kind of weird sometimes, but yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of fun. They shouldn't get stuck, though. It shouldn't get stuck. Um, so this is plus eight. So we duplicate this thing. Yeah. Off by pixel due to rounding, maybe, maybe, maybe something, something with that. Uh, maybe something with a comparison when we do CMP. All right. So add PS. Uh, yeah, maybe something with the rounding in here. Um, so let me see and overall it kind of like yeah overall it kind of works but it's just sometimes it doesn't but oh yeah so what was cool is that we checking all these things simultaneously we're checking these things simultaneously it's the get frame time that causes it to get stuck if it if when you reverse the velocity it doesn't escape the test case i already explained my approach that actually prevents that i don't want to go into that one more time but I, I can go into that a little bit briefly the idea is that you make a step without modifying the final position and you check the modified position and if it goes outside you just don't use that position because of that, it should never get stuck. I already explained it at the beginning of the stream. Uh, anyways, so, um, yeah, the, there's some sort of a bug in here. I don't know where exactly I made a bug. So, it's kind of interesting. So, maybe it's, uh, there is a bug in logic, but generally it shouldn't happen. Mm -mm. 
it hits the border, it bounces. I already explained why it shouldn't happen. You don't... Okay. I don't know why I'm arguing with the chat, obviously, with the people who don't listen to me. Um, uh, it's so frustrating, honestly. It's just like, you explain to people, you spend some time to explain to people, they don't fucking listen, and they keep saying this thing over and over again. Anyways. Um, so, maybe... What if we kind of invert this entire thing like that? Maybe that's what should happen. So EQ, right? So less and equal. So we're using... Uh -huh. So what if I just use LT in here? Right, so I'm just using LT in here. Uh, NL... Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And this one is going to be NLT. Maybe that's, that's what we want in here. Uh, okay. So, maybe that was the problem. Looks like that was the problem. Yeah. No, it was not the problem. Hmm. That's really strange. But overall, uh, overall, I think it is seems to be working. It is seems to be twerking. Um. Mm -mm. So, I'm pretty sure it's something with the comparison, but I mean, it shouldn't be the case. So, we compute the next position, right? Wait a freaking second. We have leftovers from the old code that actually modifies the position and saves it back. Freaking okay. So... <laughs> Yikes! Yikes! What the fuck? Yeah, that was yikes. So, and of course, chat just assumed all bunch of things without listening to my explanations to my approach and started to recommend things, distracting me and rubbing me a wrong way, as fucking usual. That was just a mistake. That was just a leftover from the old code. That's why I don't listen to chat. No offense, people. But if you were listening to me, uh, maybe I would be listening to you, All right? So don't get offended if I don't listen to you, because you don't listen to me, okay? Deal. So that is absolutely freaking poggers, minor friend, minor friend, minor friend. Okay, so maybe I can actually make it like uh, move a little bit faster. You know, you can expand, extend this uh, thing even further chat you can extend this shisa even further who said that you can't have even more positions in here and just organize a loop and like check all of these things in batches if you know what i'm talking about you can check all of these things in batches so you don't check you don't basically compute them one by one like you can uh, compute them uh, by pairs right you compute them by pairs but we're using 128 bits registers. Uh, more modern uh, CPUs have 256 bits registers. Even more modern CPUs have 512 bits registers. Like, like imagine how many things simultaneously you can handle, right? So you can keep scaling these things and scaling and scaling and stuff like that, right? So and yeah, that's actually kind of cool. It's, it, and like solving this sort of like a puzzle is actually so satisfying and so interesting, right? So, and it does feel like programming in Fortran, right? It does feel like programming in Fortran because in Fortran, there are array operations, right? So you can basically say, okay, I have two arrays, multiply them together, which actually gives uh, the Fortran compiler a lot of room for optimizations because you didn't tell it how exactly you want to multiply two arrays together. You just said, multiply them, right? You didn't organize a loop. You didn't say, use that instruction or that instruction. You say, multiply them together. So, and now the compiler, knowing, for instance, the sizes of the arrays can decide how exactly it will do that, right? So it sees that the arrays are four elements. It fits into XMM register, so it can just use like this XMM instructions and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, so that's actually pretty cool, and it feels like that. I, I suppose NumPy also feels like that, 
Alright, the last time I tried to use NumPy, it did in fact feel like Fortran, actually. <laughs> Honestly, NumPy feels like a just like a luggy, dynamic Fortran, right? So I don't know why people trying to reproduce Fortran in Python, but I guess that's the current thing. Uh, that's the current thing. So, uh, anyways, I, I suppose I need to actually upload that code, uh, right? So I need to upload that code somewhere for people to play with, right? So uh, let me let me do that. So I'm gonna initialize the the repo. So we have a, a bunch of shice in here that is not particularly useful, right? So I probably don't want to have this thing, right? So test is not particularly useful for us. So I'm probably gonna remove that. I'm gonna remove the executable. I'm gonna remove that. I'm gonna probably keep the notes. Maybe notes are useful for something. So I gonna remove the, all the test things in here, right? So, and do we need the ray leap headers? Are ray leap headers useful? That useful? I can actually put everything ray leap related into a separate folder. I think that's a fair thing to do. Uh, I do in fact think so. So, yeah. Uh, and then if I try to compile this entire thing, right, so I now have to say that search for Raylib in the Raylib folder, right? So, and if I try to do that, it seems to be working. It seems to be working. And I want to git ignore uh, specifically game and game.all, right? So, and if I now try to do a committee committee, hopefully, yeah, so we only have the things that are important. So let me put the license in here, right? So this is gonna be license, gonna be MIT. So that just means that you can do whatever you want, right? Whatever you want with this source code, uh, include it in your projects, maybe even sell it, except stripping away these goddamn license and my name from the code. Don't fucking do that. The above copyright notice in, in this permission notice shall be included in all copies of substantial portions of the software. It's that fucking simple. It is very easy. Literally do everything you want with this piece of code except remove this file from the code. Some people are unable to do even that. So I'm asking nicely don't remove this file if you use my code it's that fucking simple okay thank you uh so <laughs> like how much more shit do you want do whatever the fuck you want except remove my name from the code keep my name in the code credit me i did the job <sighs> not even asking for money apparently in the modern internet even that is too much like on the internet of gpt jopity your work is now my property it is too much to ask <clears throat> sorry got a little bit angry uh so Ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. Maybe I need to actually add readme. Right, so. so. Uh, well, we need to come up with a name, right? So, Fasm Ray Lib. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to call it a Fasm Ray Lib CMD. That's what I'm going to call this project. Yeah, boy, boy. Uh, so ray lib demo in fasm with cmd a simple demo that utilizes uh, that demonstrates i really hate how you have to say demo that demonstrates like duh that's what demos do so a simple app that demonstrates <laughs> Sim, uh, maybe a simple demo demo of uh, using cmd instructions and raylib in fasm right so i actually so fasm you capitalize fasm like this right so that's how you do that flat assembler flat assembler 
and array deep also gonna do it like that uh, array lib dot org is it dot org flat assembler more like fat assembler fat assembler is nasm <laughs> got him got him a simple demo to demonstrate the demonstration of a Raylib demo. <laughs> Thank you so much. But it's a Raylib.com. It's a commercial project, guys. It's not... Okay, so that's why it's .com. All right. Note it. Note it. Raysan is on it for money, then. Okay. So, quick start. Quick start. I don't judge, by the way. So, money is good. Money is good. So... You make money, you get rewarded for your work. It is always good. If we live in a society where people are not rewarded for their work, that is a society that is not going to last long. We live in a society. Okay, so we're going to do make and then we're going to just do game. So that's basically it. Uh, <clears throat> mm, all right, so... Add read me. There we go. And so let me go ahead and maybe just create a repo. Society. Ah, so <clears throat> I'm sorry. Fasm Raylip CMD. Raylip CMD. Uh, so a simple demo of I, I need to strip off these things actually. Uh -huh. So this can be that. This is gonna be public demo. I'm gonna create the repository. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Chat. Give it a star. If you give it a star, I'm going to upload the actual source code. Somebody give the star. Nobody stars it. Why nobody stars it? Give it a star. Do you want the source code or not? Oh, you can't start it because it's empty. Okay. Well. Eh. Okay, so I'm gonna add the origin and why can I start though? Why can I start? I think you're debating me, chat. I think you're debating me. You're literally debating me. Uh, all right, so I uploaded the code. There you go. Uh, so I don't want to start something that I plan to steal. Okay. I mean, feel free to steal it. Just like, don't say that you made it. <laughs> it's that fucking simple. I don't understand you people. Um, so this is the source code. There we go. So, uh, okay, that was actually a pretty fun project. We can continue extending it, but to be fair, it's kind of a pain in the ass to program in assembly, this kind of stuff. So. <laughs> Uh, because it's very easy to make mistakes, right? As you, as you have noticed, probably, right? It's very easy to make mistakes. But I think it's very useful to just gain insights into how to do this kind of stuff, right? So, um, especially if you are into developing languages, which I am, honestly, I am into developing languages. And maybe I'm going to use this kind of information for my future language development, right? So, um, right. Because I believe that one of the good ways to learn how to make programming languages is to learn how to program an assembly. That is a very important step, I believe. Learn how to program an assembly and then try to write a program that converts like source code of a simple, pro a simple program into an assembly, right? Using your assembly knowledge and rediscover all of these techniques that are used by uh, language developers, right? So things like lexing, parsing, and, uh, you know, code generation and stuff like that. Just like try to rediscover them. Uh, and if you're not going too crazy about all of that stuff, they're very simple and very much rediscoverable, right? So the language developers 
especially who works in academia, well, they're trying to portray language development as some sort of computer science, especially when it comes to parsing. It's not true. It is actually not true. They're lying. They're, they're lying to you. So just use recursive descent. And as Jonathan Blow said, even recursive descent is too much of a like cloud name for such a simple thing that it re represents, right? It's just like write the most obvious code for doing the thing. That's recursive descent, right? It's not that hard, right? So just don't overcomplicate things. Just don't overcomplicate things. Mm. So yeah, that's it for the day. Thanks everyone who's watching right now. I really appreciate that. I hope this like small two episode series of uh, assembly development and CMD was interesting, right? So um, it's going to be on YouTube as a single episode, right? Because it's basically a single topic, right? There's no need to separate that. Uh, so thanks everyone for watching and I see you all on the next recreational programming session with who? Mr. Azuzin. I love you all. Mwah.